Still lots of people joining, guys. Just a few seconds more. All right. Uh, good morning to everybody. Great seeing all of you today uh, at the Transport Forum. We've been looking forward to this great event for some time and we're grateful to the Department of Transport hosting us today. Ibrahim Siddhat has been the, uh, the key brain behind this and uh, we're excited and, and working with him and uh, looking forward to, to talk to him. Um, Bo Cameron, you want to say something? See your hand is raised. Not okay, thank you. All right, so ladies and gents, let me share our uh, program. And uh, we're running on a bit of a backup system here. We had a problem with, with our system this morning. So I'm just uh, finding myself through all the backup systems here, but this part is going well and we will make it work. It's a bit of a software glitch here. We didn't have sound on the on the main PC, so we're on the backup system. All right, so our, our program for today, it is obviously the 18th of November, 2021, and we're talking South Africa's Integrated Public Transport Network in international context. And uh, as I told you before that uh, Ibrahim Siddharth kindly um, hosted this event for us and he's the, uh, the brainchild behind all of this and uh, we're looking forward to, to spending the day with, with DOT. Um, all right, so the program then, we've got Kiwi Manana who's going to do the, the admission, the, the opening address for us, the welcome, and uh, we're excited having Kuba doing the opening address also, how to get the cost down in public transport. And then we will have um, certain panels. The first panel will be the Integrated Public Transport Network and the third generation BRT, South African Lessons from International Developments. All right, and then later on, we'll have a second panel, which is the IPTNS and the minibus taxi industry. And then also later on, we've got a panel, the bus network redesign and the IPTN. Uh, ladies and gents, I'm not going to sit and read through all these, uh, all these, um, the agenda. Obviously, you have it and you can see it for yourself. All right, but obviously, these events are all of them uh, complementary, and we would like to give recognition to our sponsors. And we've also got industry alliances with the Transport Forum. Um, we've got the South African Association of Freight Forwarders, we've got the South African Space Parcel Association, South African Bus Operators Association, the African Road Industry Association, and the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport. And we're very proud in having all of them with us. And quickly, uh, SAF, as I've known, they already from uh, since 1929, 20, uh, is the National Association of Members of the Outer Public of South Africa, obviously representing the freight forwarding industry. Uh, all these associations signed up to the Transport Forum since January this year. It was very exciting for us to bring them all on board. We've got SAPA, Express Parcel Association, represented the body and voice of the express delivery industry in South Africa. And we've got South African Bus Operators Association focusing on the bus and coach industry. Um, Basil Governor, Executive Director there, they're working closely with myself. We've got uh, Aria, that's the South African Road Industry Association. Zelen Flapu is the CEO of this organization. Uh, they're doing lots of work in um, uh, bringing in third party access into the road system. And uh, it's very important for us, obviously, to, to support these initiatives. Then we've got the Chartered Institute of Logistics and Transport, leading international professional body for everyone who works within the supply chain, logistics and transport. And we've got our media partners, Freight News, Railways Africa, and Engineering News. Obviously, there are many other journalists involved. 
as well would be very appreciative of. Uh, but Fright News, uh, previously also known as FTW, they've been, been uh, with us actually very much since the start of the Transport Forum. And uh, there they are. They, it's a South African organization, established Innovative Detective, founded already in 1953. And it's all about logistics, freight and logistics news. And uh, you just subscribe to these organizations. You obviously will get the, the links from our website. Railways Africa, African continent specialist trade technical business to business online publication covering all aspects of the rail sector. And engineering news, bringing in the economy news, engineering news, and uh, they signed up uh, about two months ago as a form of media alliance with the Transport Forum. Now we've got our valued gold sponsors with the Transport Forum. These sponsors, um, uh, University of Johannesburg, they've been part of us actually since the start of this transfer forum more than 14 years ago. Rob Jackie Walters and Nathan and Lenny Pisa also joined in, and uh, they very much um, supporting me, mentoring myself as well to a good extent in terms of where we should focus with the transfer forum. But their cargo, it is uh, Gary Marshall, CEO there. It's a leading cargo airline providing express airport to airport solutions and related services to the carrier and express logistics industry. C-Track, many years gold sponsor. It's a leading global software as a service and a big data company for vehicle tracking, fleet management, and insurance and telematics solutions. Uh, they actually indicated that from January next year, they're taking our platinum sponsors with the transport forum. And that's the first platinum sponsor we're going to have you know, for some time. Uh, previously, we had these systems, and uh, now it's our first platinum sponsor from January again, so we're glad. Thank you, uh, C-Track, for your good support. Zutari, it's uh, consulting engineers. Many years, about eight years with the transfer forum. Ability, it's uh, commercial insurance underwriters focusing on the bus and coach uh, industry. We've got Indwe, it's uh, South Africa's largest independent brokers offering personal, business, and specialist risk and insurance advisory services. Unitrans, innovation, expertise, below it. It's a transportation and logistics company that has been unlocking value in the supply chains in various sectors of the sub Saharan economy since 1962. Established strategic alliance with its customers and continue unlocking value to operational and SHEQ, excellent. Then we've got Global Trade Solution, offers uh, customs connect and consulting services. Then with the Transport Forum for more than two years already, gold sponsor. Standard Bank, uh, been an ad hoc sponsor for many years since last year, October, they joined us as a, a gold sponsor over 158 years of experience, believe that dreams matter and that together we can make them reality. Thank you, Standard Bank. Then Kuba, we've got also uh, Nasipu Pambuka today, the country manager of Kuba. Kuba is going to present today and she will tell you more about Kuba. Uh, they've been part of us for many years, more than five years already, a gold sponsor. Easy clear. So, Loft is a software provider for the customs and uh, clearing industry. Huawei. We always say Huawei is not only producing cell phones, but Huawei is also intelligent transport solutions. Globalized even, uh, urban world transportation is critical. Uh, Huawei help design and implement smart infrastructure for transport for rail and urban road networks to smart airports, promoting the increased use of ICT in the transportation industry. It helps to optimize transportation services, making travel more convenient, safer, and more efficient. Uh, go and have a look at their website, ladies and gents, and you will be pleasantly surprised what the one does. JC Auditors, auditing company, accredited RTMS Road Transport Management System and International Standards Organization Certification. Thanks to Oliver for their support. 
And then we've got the Bunya Capital who's focusing for us on the taxi industry. Uh, we see Majolo is the group CEO of Abunya. So he's got lots of experience also in the taxi industry. So uh, yeah, great having them on board as well. So those are all our sponsors. We can give them a big hand for making this transfer forum uh, possible. Uh, we've also got the economists. I don't think I've mentioned uh, Mike Schusler. He's an ad hoc sponsor of the transfer forum. I've been a lot uh, with his expertise and he's also a, a sponsor for a few months with the transfer forum till the end of December. So I would like to remind you of the business directory. Can I ask you please guys to, um, to, um, to mute yourself, just keep yourself on mute. I've got a bit of a challenge this morning with the technology here. I can't always see everybody, so um, I'll sort it out just now and then the session continues. But uh, I can't mute you because this, uh, this is a problem with my system for some reason. So the business directory is actually being outsourced to, to Olga Mashilu from Boleng Bontle um, Consultant, and she administers this. It's only 450 rands per annum, and it's very popular. So please contact Olga to get your company registered um, on the business directory um, and get exposure, great exposure through this initiative. So the presentations you see here today, we will upload them to the Toronto Forum website. And, uh, now please guys, put yourselves on mute, I can't do it. Right, more than 2,000 unique visitors on this website. You can download the presentations you see here today um, from this website. All that you need to do is you need to log in to the left of the, the screen when you're on that transfer form, that uh, website. Just log in. If you haven't got to log in yet, uh, click on sign up and you can create your own complimentary um, sign up. So, when you want to, once you've signed in, then you can go to events and downloads. You get a simple little uh, search engine that's actually very powerful. And you can you can type in there a person's name or a topic and hit search. And then you search through 14 years worth of uh, presentations. Or a category you can select today's date. And then you can um, uh, search, on, you know, the presentations uploaded related to a certain date. All right, that brings us back to our program. As I said, we're proudly being hosted by the uh, Department of Transport. And I would like now to ask um, Ms. Kibi Manana, she's an acting DDG Public Transport at DOT, to do the introductory comments for us. For us. Thank you very much, Kibi. See, I think we not see if Kibi is in here. They can just try and figure out what's going on. Ibrahim, are you on the call? Hi, Harry. Yes, I'll just check. Give, give me 30 seconds. Thank you. Right, Kibi is coming in, I see. Yeah, thanks, Harry. She's almost in. Uh, she was just struggling to find the Zoom link. Yeah. Too many emails. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's still lots of people joining as we go along.
Kiwi, can you hear us? Just giving Kiwi the opportunity to get into the session and join us. Uh, morning. Is it Terry? Yes, Kiwi. Good morning. Hi, how are you? I'm thanks yourself. I'm okay, thank you. My apologies. I'm in two meetings. I'm in audit committee and also this. So I just, yeah, but I'm in now. Thank you. So you'll tell me when you need me to start? We'll be waiting for you to do the, the welcome. Oh, thank okay, you. okay. Okay, then. Okay, so I, I, I must start. Okay. Uh, so good morning um, to everyone. Um, it's Kibi Manana from the National Department of Transport. Um, I've been requested to do uh, an opening for today, uh, just to also thank Harry and, um, and the organization that he uh, is linked to for allowing us to host this session through them. Um, so as a Department of Transport, I'm sure most of you, you know the work that we're doing. I thought maybe I must just quickly give an overview. Uh, we, we work uh, on integrated public transport networks, and these were proposed uh, in the public transport strategy that was developed some time ago. Uh, I think it was in 2007. And basically the strategy had proposed uh, that we uh, look at upgrading the existing public transport system um, uh, to a certain standard that the quality would be different um, and also introducing new forms of public transport. And we wanted, it, we wanted an integrated uh, network, which basically then uh, meant that we would have uh, one ticket, that we'd have one timetable, one brand, um, and one standard, um, and one network. So if you are on the IPTNs, you shouldn't be um, you know, there shouldn't be any breakup in terms of, there should just be a seamless movement um, of people or, or of, of your journey must just be seamless. And how have we done? Um, it's been good and not so good. Um, in terms of scale and scope, we haven't really achieved the, um, the, the, the original objective that by now all uh, 12 municipalities should have launched uh, their services. Um, currently, we've got only six that have that are currently operating, and we then have uh, four that are still outstanding that are supposed to be launching their services, um, hopefully before the end of uh, the financial year. And the six that are operational are your Cape, Cape Town, George, uh, City of Joburg, uh, Nelson Mandela Bay, and Swanee. And the ones, the four ones that are still uh, that are supposed to still launch are. Three municipalities were suspended some time ago uh, because they were, like, they were struggling in terms of making progress. We've had a number of challenges um, with implementation, some of them you know, ranging from political instability in municipalities to cities not really having a sufficient capacity or being fully geared up you know, to be uh, uh, contracting authorities. And those are some of the challenges that now we're currently working with cities on. We've made certain lessons and implementation shifts. It's just that I don't have time to go into that. Um, for example, one of the shifts we are making is that we are proposing that we have a differentiated uh, offering approach uh, based on the size of the municipality, um, which is what the, the strategy had actually proposed but somehow that message got lost in transition. Now, going forward, we just want to make sure that um, 
in terms of the agenda that we deliver on. Uh, integration is still critical. Um, in the next, uh, from this year till 2029, we want to make sure that cities speed up their operations rather than focusing on building infrastructure. Um, cities have been told to scale back on infrastructure, um, on, on, on infrastructure plans and spending, and that there should be full and speedy integration with existing services, for example, your metro bus, your 20 bus services, urban transport. And also a critical uh, uh, objective is to make sure that we align the work that we're doing with IPTNs, uh, and because IPTNs are funded by the Public Transport Network Grant together with the Public Transport Operations Grant. So those are critical things for us um, as, as a department as we uh, go into the future. We're also realizing that the role of the minibus taxi industry is very important. Um, and we it's, it's one area that we are focusing on, uh, looking at transformation of that industry, formalization, and looking at different transitional models uh, to allow them to become formalized. Um, and we also note that capacity is also critical across all spheres, national, uh, provincial as well as municipal. So those are some of the areas that as a national department we're looking into focusing on um, into the future. And I'd like to wish the deliberations for this session, that we have uh, successful deliberations and that um, I'm sure the kind of inputs that we will be receiving from the people that have been lined up. We've got local experts like Crystal, we've got international experts as well, and I'm sure they will be sharing their knowledge and and um, some of the lessons that we learned and shed some light on how we can then make sure that we improve um, public transport in South Africa. Thank you very much, Henry. Thank you so much, Kibi. This was great. Thank you for your support and this, this uh, great introduction. We really appreciate that. Hopefully you can stay online a while with us and uh, that we can maybe have you in the panel discussion as well. So thank you very much for this. All right, ladies and gents, let's have a look at our first presenter for this day. It is Nozipu Pambuka. She's the country manager for Kuba. Kuba is also a gold sponsor of the Transport Forum. And Nozipu is going to tell us how to get the cost down in public transport. Nozipu, we've been waiting for this and looking forward to this presentation for some time. Thank you very much. Uh, good day, everyone. Trust that uh, uh, you can hear me. Yes, we can hear, and the presentation is great. You can continue. Okay, thank you. Uh, honorable guests, DDG, fellow presenters, the Transport Forum, ladies and gentlemen, protocol observed. I am here today to present a topic that is very dear to my heart, which is how to reduce costs in public transport. I'm actually glad that from the previous presenter, I've just heard that uh, most of the things that I want to talk about today are already in motion. And what is going to be important for us is to ensure that we scale and actually move with high speed. It's a very wide topic and has many layers as it relates to the different stakeholders, which would be in this case, the government and the taxpayer, transport operators, and also the commuters. I'm consciously grouping the government and the taxpayer as one thing, as government uses public funds and this needs to be accounted for and needs to be optimized. Let me declare outright, upright, sorry. One second. Yeah. Basically, my agenda is just going to be focused on defining the stakeholders and actually putting in recommendations on what each party can do 
and what the parties can do jointly. Let me declare outright that I work for Cuba, a company that seeks to migrate transport users into the digital era. Its products are implemented worldwide and we see ourselves as being on the leading edge of technology. Hook them up with uh, our clients and our contractors and we get them employment. It must be noted that the solutions we bring are often tailor-made for each environment, a situation that often results in over-specification and contributes to cost increases, an item that I will revisit later in my presentation. If you see that there is a, the screen has a few companies that are in the stable, which is what makes the suite of what we provide. I'm also a student at Da Vinci, and I view innovation and technology as an enabler. Lastly, I'm a member of the public, and therefore, I also seek to use public transport, and I'm in dire need of affordable transport. Let me begin by first defining public transport. Public transport is defined as shared passenger vehicles that are publicly available for multiple users. It is any service provided to the public at large for the carriage of, pass of passengers by road, by rail, by air, or by sea. But for the purposes of our discussion, I'm going to limit this to road and rail as these are the most widely used modes of transport in South Africa. The National Household Travel Survey that was done in 2020, uh, which was undertaken by SETSA, shows that 66% of the South African population uses public transport. From this 66%, I have had 83% that use the Unibus taxi, 14.6% use the bus, and only 2.4% use the train. From this then, I would also like to uh, just contextualize um, the importance of an efficient public transport system. Analyzing mobility trends in the metropolitan areas of South Africa, it, that reveals that, that there is, there is and it shows us where public transport uh, generated from its, its use. People have always been on the move in search of green pastures. And in the olden days, people were either running away uh, from um, conflict or people were just moving to where there is uh, land uh, and uh, grazing land. But uh, in the South African context or later in the years, we note that the apartheid spatial planning where townships were located distant from the city has resulted in a large population that needs to commute for hours on end, traveling long distances to the hub of opportunity. So the rail was the first one that was developed, which was meant to be the backbone. And later buses came through as feeders to complement and supplement the network Furthermore, uh, around uh, the early 80s, the minibus industry became a key respondent to the mobility challenges and has been carrying passengers in many different areas of the country for over the period of time. So therefore, there is now for a need for more official mechanisms and the evolution is inevitable. Just looking at some of the research done, Dr. Jean Paul Rodrick and Dr. Theo Nodepo, they reveal that how, density, how, dense, how high density transport infrastructure and highly connected networks are commonly associated with high levels of development. So if we want to develop, we need to just make sure as a country that we optimize on the infrastructure. They go on further to say, when transport systems are efficient, they provide economic and social opportunities and benefits. So the spin-offs of these can be summarized as the fact that people will be able to access employment and services. 
we will be able to attract tourism because tourists want to go to a place where there is inefficient, where there is efficient transport. Transport needs to be affordable. Transport also helps in providing social networks and social capital because we need to go and visit our relatives and friends. It attracts investments. When we are using uh, mass movers, we are able to reduce the carbon emissions and we are able to optimize then on the work on the network in the use of infrastructure and increase its carrying capacity. So therefore, it is clear that when we have developed a public transport system that is first class, then uh, this becomes an essential driver to the development of the economy. Let us then look at how the stakeholders can engage with the cost aspects of transport. To sustain public transport operations, operators are required to charge fares to commuters to augment the subsidies. A country like ours that has got many needs, you can actually find that even though government subsidizes transport, but it's never enough. But in instances where there are no subsidies, e.g. the minibus taxi industry, the fares are designed solely to sustain the operations. The greatest challenge is finding a balance for all stakeholders, including the commuter, the authority, which is the government, and the operator. So to summarize the key objective of an efficient pricing strategy, for instance, from the government side, the objectives are to set governance and policies, and, and policies that increase ridership and encourage social inclusion, which will in turn support development. Number two, it would be investing, the objective would be to invest and maintain infrastructure of transport, which is a, a huge cost, cost driver of operations through public funding. The third one would be the provision of subsidies for all mass movers, be it bus, be it taxi, be it train. So if I were to move now to the operator and try and look what the objectives would be, it would be then for covering the costs to ensure that the transport is sustainable and also to build an attractive public transport system. For the commuter, the objective is to minimize the cost of travel and also to travel in a convenient, safe transport system. What do I mean then when I talk about affordability? Transport affordability has been defined by researchers as the extent to which a user can afford a transport journey. Based on this definition, one can determine affordability by the pre-prescribed thresholds. And this is unique for each country. According to the Victoria Policy Institute, for transport to be affordable in South Africa, it is required to be a, mini, a maximum of 10% of a person's total income. So therefore, this is sort of calculated uh, for each uh, environment or for each country. The 2020 National Household Travel Survey from States SA revealed that taxes appear to be the most expensive mode of travel at 561 rand per month, followed by buses at 502 rand per month and trains at 402 rand per month. So workers in the households from the lower quantile group are then likely to spend in our context more than 20% more than 20 of their monthly household income on public transport. So therefore, this exposes just how unaffordable the situation currently is. So at this point then, I would like to look at what could be done to bring the cost down. The view is to look at long-term recommendations that are sustainable and require effort by all stakeholders. 
I'm going to start by looking at governments. What is interesting, one of um, my fellow workers, when I was writing or thinking about this, and I said the government needs to do this, needs to do this, she says it's not the right way of putting it. You can't say government needs, who are you? And I said, I'm a taxpayer. It's important that I actually state what I think should happen, but I know most of the things are happening. So I'm just going to say, it would be desirable for government to start subsidizing the minibus taxes as they are used by the lower income groups who are spending over 20% of their income. Also minibus taxes carry the highest volume of passengers compared to the other modes of transport. If encouraged, if government were to hold the tax recapitalization process accountable to the given mandate of improving services. It's not enough to just talk. We need to start walking the talk and we need to walk faster. The Minister of Transport, Honorable Mr. Figile Mbalula, in his 2021-2022 uh, budget speech, agreed to revising the tax recapitalization program mandate as it is the key to the efforts of transforming the face of public transport and ensuring that the tax industry occupies its rightful place in the system. Government may need to visit, to revisit the current subsidization model so that it does not only focus on providing a subsidy that is based only on ridership. Government, and for that matter, everybody gathered here should consider transport as a system rather than loosely connected modes. An integrated transport view, which is something that has been spoken about for the last decade, which I think Ms. Um, Kibi Manana has also referred to, um, can be complemented, which features such as one transport currency, connectivity for shared ridership, data and mobility as a service. Government needs to open to the, to, must be open to the use of technology in meeting objectives. However, features should not be over-specified as this tends to make technology more costly. And I'm saying this because I am coming from the private sector from that end of the spectrum. So where possible, global standards should be acceptable to minimize the development efforts required in customizing solutions for the South African market. All parties need to work together through proper engagement. The design can be rationalized with a resultant reduction in costs. Lately, over-regulation has formed a barrier to this meaningful engagement. The last one that I would like to suggest is that government must provide safety and security of the transport infrastructure to minimize the burden of replenishment for the operator as this becomes a cost driver in the long run. The CEO of Prasa recently stated that the entity has lost over 4 billion in less than 12 months due to vandalism and sabotage. Recent riots in July in our country have resulted in huge financial losses as infrastructure, including transport infrastructure, was destroyed and vandalized. Let me now look at the recommendations. Um, I have just uh, cited the ones um, from the government side, what I think needed to be done. And uh, I want now to look at the ones for the operator. Generally, the biggest cost drivers for transport operators, apart from infrastructure, uh, is the human element and fuel. The costs can be minimized if one were to look at automation. Automation is defined as a process that can be performed with human minimal intervention. This, as you know, is already a, a happening it exists in some transport sectors. However, 
there is room for this to be scaled up. The next one that I would want to look at is self-driving technology. Basically, if we were to, like to start looking at self-driving cars and trains, this could aid in removing the human cost. Obviously, this must be balanced by upskilling uh, the people that were doing these manual jobs to actually move and do something else. Um, one has to look as well at alternatives to fuel. Electric and hydrogen fuel cars can be considered to reducing the dependency on fuel. Unfortunately, the jury is still out on its efficiency and costs, especially given our current ESCOM crisis. Perhaps other sources of energy can be utilized uh, going forward. Uh, the operators also need to consider a shared data model that will drive growing, that will also make sure that we are able to use a connectivity uh, that will underpin new technologies. This now looks at artificial intelligence and the digital infrastructure. This will lead to advanced digital platforms and techniques that can be used together and to analyze, to analyze data. The operators need to aggregate data and share the travel data on various platforms, such as social media and mobile apps, for the commuter to be able to plan and optimize on their trips. For example, if I look at how train, a commuter saves about 25% on travel costs if they purchase a, month, a monthly pass versus v buying a daily pass. But now if that information is out there, one needs to also look that when I get out of the how train, is the other mode of transport that I need also available so that I could be able to buy this monthly and be able to integrate it with something else. So this travel data should also be shared widely with other stakeholders so that we can determine more eff 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 effective and efficient me mechanisms to minimize travel time and costs. So if I were to look at the commuter now, I am also suggesting something that's not very common to us, that when we have shorter trips, we need to consider walking or cycling, which also provides a an additional benefit to the health of the citizens. We need to understand though, that for this to be possible, the safety of the citizens must be guaranteed. In closing, I, in, in, in closing, uh, it's important that we need to understand and consider that all stakeholders have a part to play in this, and they need to be inv invested to ensure that we have sustain sustainability and affordability of the system going forward. I thank you. Thank you so much, uh, you need, uh, um, Nusipo. This is extremely important, understanding the, uh, the bigger picture and uh, to see the balance you guys are bringing in. So thank you very much for this great presentation. And uh, we hope that you're available for the panel discussion. Uh, yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Ladies and gents, we're going to put up our program. Just admitting more people into the meeting. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to start with the first panel, Integrated Public Transport Network and Third Generation BRT is a lessons learned from international developments. So we have here Mr. Walter Hook, he's the Vice President, BRT Plan and CEO People Oriented Cities. The editor of BRT Planning Guide 2017 and former consultant on the Ria Vieja and my city. So Walter, thank you very much for joining us all the way from, 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 from America and uh, we're looking forward to listening to you. 
Thank you very much. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, in order to share my screen, I think somebody else needs to stop. There we go. I think we're good. Well, thank you very much for allowing me to speak today and thanks to the National DOT for making this possible. Um, I'd like to go over some global trends in the bus rapid transit, uh, looking at infrastructure, service change, approach, changes to service approaches, uh, fare collection, how the informal industry is being integrated, subsidies, and then talk a little bit about what I think needs to happen next in South Africa. Um, globally, uh, countries and cities all over the world continue to expand their rapid transit networks. And it seems like, you know, the, for each kilometer of new rapid transit you build, uh, you can get another 5,000 tons of, uh, carbon emissions reduced. Uh, as you can see from this graph, uh, bus rapid transit, light rail is expanding, but what's really taken off in the last decade is heavy rail. Um, and the heavy rail expansion, uh, you can see is um, from the next slide, it's almost entirely because of what's going on in China. It turns out that 60% of new uh, rapid heavy rail rapid transit construction happened in China. It all happened in the last decade. Uh, what's happening if you take China out of the equation is you see that that bus rapid transit, light rail, and heavy rail are sort of on similar trajectories. This graph is showing sort of how many kilometers of new rapid transit are being built each year. Um, the other big change in our field is that China has moved in as a very large financer for new uh, transportation infrastructure. It's even exceeding the World Bank in a lot of years. Uh, you can see that it's extremely predominant in Africa. Uh, South Africa itself has received over a billion dollars in subsidized loans from the Chinese government. This was mostly for your, uh, for your locomotives. Uh, and I know, of course, about the controversy surrounding that. Uh, my NGO has pre produced a report that has been tracking China's transport sector lending over the world, where it's going, uh, what they're doing right, what could be improved uh, in case anyone is interested. Um, BRT is still growing rapidly as a, as a sort of in investment choice for uh, rapid transit technology in a lot of markets. It's growing still in the United States. It's really boomed in France and the Nordic countries. In Latin America, it continues to grow rapidly. Uh, Pakistan has a massive new BRT program. Indonesia has two more cities coming online. Several parts of the Middle East, particularly Jordan uh, and Sub-Saharan Africa, uh, as you'll see on the next slide, Bus rapid transit has really spread from South Africa uh, to the rest of Sub-Saharan Africa. You can see there are BRT projects already implemented uh, in Dar es Salaam and Lagos, but uh, and certainly all over uh, all over South Africa. But there are many, many more under construction or planned all over the continent. A lot of this was inspired by the very impressive. Uh, systems in Cape Town and in Johannesburg. Uh, in the United States, uh, a few of the really nice new systems that have just come online include the Albuquerque system, it's a gold rated, uh, the Indianapolis Indigo system. Uh, there's a new system in Oakland that connects to Berkeley, uh, very well done. Uh, one of the biggest new systems is in Peshawar, Pakistan. Uh, it's carrying over 200,000 people in a very poor city. Uh, China has several new systems uh, that are very high uh, capacity, high speed. Uh, although in China, because of the growth of the metro, uh, there aren't as many new systems coming online. Uh, 
Uh, Central Asia has a lot of new systems going in. This is one in Tbilisi, Georgia. Uh, there's some other trends I wanted to highlight. Uh, moving BRT systems into the downtown is one of those trends. This is a small sort of piece of a BRT in Chicago's Central Loop. Um, in France, they, they tend to be building uh, bus rapid transit systems with extremely fancy buses, often bi-articulated, often using alternative energy, electrics, even some hydrogen. Uh, Mexico City's system, of course, continues to expand. Uh, Reykjavik is planning a new system. Um, now in South Africa, the BRT program, as you're all quite familiar, uh, took off with a, with a, a huge uh, start back in the days of the World Cup. And since then, of course, it has slowed down very considerably with extensive delays. Not only has that happened to the bus rapid transit program, but the, there hasn't been any expansion of heavy rail. And of course, the commuter rail system is in a state of, of near collapse. Um, some of the things that are often uh, confusing about why the systems look the way they do is that back when we were uh, working with the, with the cities to, to, to plan and design them, uh, there was a very uh, optimistic belief that the systems would be much bigger than they are today. So Johannesburg, for instance, believed initially at least that they could build all of phase one by 2010. And of course now it's 2021. So you look out at these very large stations and you think, what in the world were they thinking? Well, uh, the designers were being told that the system was going to be uh, uh, already phase one would be done by 2010. So we assume the system would be much bigger than it is. In terms of infrastructure trends, uh, another thing you're seeing across the world is cities are really running their bus rapid transit systems into their urban core, uh, often on very narrow streets. So what they've chosen to do a lot of the time is to uh, take over the entire street in a transit mall or a busway uh, and then use the rest of the street for improved pedestrian and cycling infrastructure. One of the more famous ones is in New York City on 14th Street, which we were lo loosely involved with. And you've seen a huge bump in bus speeds uh, between 22 and 47%. The passenger ridership went way up by 24%. And three other similar corridors in New York were became full transit malls in the last couple of years. And you can see what this can do in terms of an urban transformation. Now the, the, the business improvement district for Union Square has come up with a design for radical pedestrianization of the entire area. And this is generating a lot of excitement. Um, so these are renderings of what 14th Street might look like. Uh, inspired by New York City's 14th Street Transit Mall, uh, San Francisco recently turned Market Street into a transit only street as well. And uh, it's had a huge improvement in the buses, 12% faster and also big bump in cycling. Uh, this is happening also in Latin America. This is a transit only street with a bike lane in Belo Horizonte uh, in Brazil. Mexico City ran a bus only corridor through its, um, through its uh, historical center. This used to be entirely blocked by street vendors and whatnot. And it's been bringing back the historical core. It's now extremely vibrant and it's brought the crime down dramatically. Uh, this is Dar es Salaam, which ran its BRT system through its historical core. Um, Bogota put, uh, put its BRT through its historical core already quite some years ago, but they've gone now with bi-articulated buses. Many of them are, uh, many of the new bus fleet is electric and hybrid electric. Um, so Cape Town uh, did run its BRT into its city center, although it sort of doesn't go all the way into the, into the historical core. Uh, certainly we would love to see something like a transit only street on Long Street or maybe a one way pair uh, might bump up transit ridership into the urban core. Uh, the Johannesburg BRT system runs, uh, Ray of Aya runs right into the urban core and it uh, uh, provides a very good service there. We'd like to see that leading to more urban regeneration around those safe zones. Some 
uh, some cities that have very dense urban cores are actually building upwards. The Peshawar BRT is largely elevated through its historical core. It's built on streets that are only about 20 meters wide. Uh, China is putting BRT on elevated highways. Um, and you can see what the rest of the traffic looks like. So these are systems that are working pretty well. Um, the, um, the, uh, the other big trend we're seeing is particularly true in Europe and, and Latin America is the move towards battery electric buses that usually are recharged in the depots overnight. Um, they are having some teething issues in the United States uh, with <clears throat> various problems. But, uh, but certainly there will be more and more of them coming online, but Bogota and Santiago now have two enormous electric bus fleets with hundreds of new vehicles. And of course, China is responsible for the largest uh, electric bus fleet. <clears throat> Most of the electric buses in the world are now in China. And of course, China, once again, has stolen the jump on the rest of us and is largely the lowest cost manufacturer of battery electric buses. Um, so I want to talk now a little bit about uh, what we're calling third generation BRT. It's sort of a bit of a change of thinking in terms of service planning from what we were sort of thinking back when we were working with South African engineers and planners and we're working on my city and on uh, Rehavaya. Uh, the initial sort of first generation of BRT was sort of, you brought, we brought our sort of light rail thought to the table and we designed systems that where the bus would simply run up and down a dedicated bus lane and it would stop at every stop uh, sort of the way a light rail system would or a heavy rail system would uh, and a lot of systems are still designed like this mexico city's metro bus is like that it just the bus route cons consists exactly of where the dedicated bus lane goes and it only stops at special BRT type of stations like what you have in Rehavaya. Um, those systems found in some cities, they didn't get a lot of ridership. So they added feeder buses to sort of transfer terminals. And this was the pattern that emerged over time in Curitiba, Brazil, for instance. And that has been copied all over the world. Uh, so now Lima, Dar es Salaam is designed that way. And that was our thinking also back in the 2010s, that that was sort of the way to go. Those trunk and feeder based routing systems, they, um, they got more complex. Bogota used a trunk and feeder oriented service plan, but they, within the BRT trunk infrastructure, they also introduced uh, express buses that had a variety of limited stopping services. They introduced a lot of bus routes that went between BRT corridors. So you have something like a hundred routes now in Bogota, but they run, you know, between various BRT trunk corridors and with various limited stop services, but still very much with a trunk feeder sort of approach. Uh, what sort of happened since then is more and more cities are sort of rationalizing their bus network first so that it kind of goes where people need to go and then building the BRT infrastructure on those sections of the bus network that have the highest demand and the slowest speeds. And so for instance, CT Fast Track, you would, this is a new system in Hartford, Connecticut. The bus route will take you from downtown down the busway but the end of the busway isn't really where people are going. So the bus continues on beyond the bus, the dedicated busway, and it takes you into the neighborhoods, et cetera, without forcing you to transfer to a, uh, to a second service at a transfer hub. That ends up saving quite a lot of money um, <clears throat> because you don't have to build a transfer facility. You don't have to go through the hassle of transferring and, um, and all of that. Uh, the, uh, the new systems are mostly being designed in this way. Peshawar is like this. It has a trunk BRT service that runs up and down the infrastructure, but the services continue on to
seemed to me we lost uh, lost Walter there. Just wait a while for him to reconnect. Those of you who are joining in, we're just waiting for the panelists to join. We, we lost the signal there. Ibrahim, are you still on the call? Uh, hi, Harry, I'm here. Yes, um, maybe we can do a little talk here while we're waiting for him. Uh, See, Rob is also uh, unmuted. Tell us uh, more about the old days, 2010. Can, does Walter actually know that he's, I hope he's not talking, <laughs> still presenting? No, How he's, he's we, off the call. Uh, oh, okay, so... Maybe the Atlantic cable went down. So, yeah. Uh, let's. Uh, it's a pity because he he got cut just before he he was going to get to the provocative stuff. Uh, yeah, I'm quite sure you'll join us, isn't it? Okay. Do we do we want to take Rob and come back, or you think that's too much of a mixed uh, fruit salad? Rob, would you be willing to present now? Yeah, of course. Uh, yeah, uh, I do want to take um, some of the momentum from um, Walter. Uh, well, it doesn't look like he's going to get back. I guess if he's not back in in the next minute, maybe uh, I'll do that. Thank you very much. I was just putting up the program for people to be oriented. So we'll be doing Rob Kelly now. Uh, and as soon as Walter joins us, then he will, he will present after Rob again. Um, and then we'll have Prof. Christopher Fenter, the IP10 cities, and questions and answers. And then there's the second second half of the session this afternoon. Uh, Harry, I'll, I'll forward you Walter's number. Uh, just keep a lookout for it. Thank you, I will do that. Okay, Rob, so if you can kindly present then your presentation. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, uh, Harry, is my screen visible to you? You can proceed, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, I guess I'm going to pick up on some of Walter's themes and on some of Nasipo's themes. And if I could firstly thank uh, Ibrahim and uh, Kibi and the Department of Transport for inviting me today. It's certainly a pleasure to talk to you all. Um, I see a number of colleagues that I've worked with in the past. It's certainly nice to see them kick around and uh, I'm still kicking around. Um, my talk today is more uh, wanting to get a reaction, really. Um, while at some times uh, I'm going to be inquisitive, 
Um, my comments are primarily based on, on my experience uh, having worked in South Africa and more recently also in Auckland, New Zealand. Um, and since I left South Africa, I spent some time in Nairobi as well. And I am very involved in uh, Dublin Transport in Dublin uh, as Division Director for Jacobs. Uh, but I'm not speaking on behalf of Jacobs today. I'm speaking really on behalf of myself, and my own opinions and views. So forgive me as well if I come across being a little bit um, inquisitive. I won't even call it critical, but I'm quite familiar with the situation in South Africa. Um, I finished work with the, the city of Schwanis uh, BRT project there uh, in 2016. Um, but I've been back in South Africa a couple of times since. And I just want to re-emphasize the importance of public transport to South Africans, because it's really, you know, it's really part of the future livelihood and prosperity for hundreds and thousands of South African children that are really imperiled without access to higher education and higher quality jobs. So safe, affordable and reliable mass transit, it's essential for this purpose alone. And you know, Ireland is not immune or a long, long way away from where South Africa found itself in 1994. We spent many years colonized by our British neighbors. And it was really only in the 1960s and 70s that Ireland became a professional industrialized economy. Uh, when I was born and grew up, we were a completely agricultural economy. Our GPTs, GDPs were very low. And we didn't have any form of public public transport in our country. But today, not only those things are driving our need to change, but carbon footprint and climate action is the new driving force for change. And that has to be as big a driving force now as, as, as empowering our local people to gain higher education and higher quality jobs. However, COVID has affected the way we view mass transit the last two years, it's affected patronages, but actually there are good things coming out of COVID. Um, we're learning the importance of clean air, fresh air, safe, healthy, clean systems, not systems that are overly crowded, congested, unsafe, unhealthy in terms of air. The clean air is now as important as clean water and clean food. But the issues, as I see facing South Africa, are challenging because mass transit performance, I call it mass transit. When I talk mass transit, I'm really talking rail and BRT bus. Um, it's not sustainable. It's only economic. And the sad thing is that you are lagging well behind other comparable cities worldwide. But there is good news because and I think we're going to speak a lot about this today. And again, this is not coming from any other third parties that I've heard speak today, but my own opinion, so it's an independent opinion. I believe that there is a strong backbone. I've engaged with and spent many years really engaging with um, uh, taxi industry stakeholders and taxi industry associations. And the minibus taxi industry is a backbone upon which your rail, bus, mass transit system can be developed. But I think it's important to keep in mind that while minibus taxis are playing a huge role, and I think it was Nasipo mentioned 80% of all your public, public transports by, by minibus taxi, it's not mass transit, and it's not particularly safe or comfortable, and we know it's riven with rival operators. And the taxi industry, they work without government subvention, but they are a high polluter. In their current, within their current structure, they're not readying themselves for the carbon footprint challenge and the climate challenges that are ahead. And they tend to be very crowded, which of course, in, in, in times of COVID and this, you know, we're gonna be living with COVID for many, many years, we know that. Um, the systems don't really have the safety features and the climate features built into them are the mass transit capacities that we need. So the question we're, we're facing 
maybe today is the start to bring this up, is the how can South Africa better leverage the asset of the taxi industry? But as well as doing that, uplifting the mass transit system to vastly improve the options for South Africans, while also addressing carbon in transport. Now, my experience in South Africa has shown me that you guys have a world-class road network. You know, I've been all over the world. The road network is second to none. But your public transport, and particularly your active travel network, is way, way behind. And active travel is worth focusing on, you know, I, I, and Yosipa mentioned it. It's becoming a bigger and bigger part of transport lives in most cities in the world. And South Africa has massive opportunities in this area. And of course, a lot of uh, people, as we know, who can't afford public transport do walk and have to walk. But because of your spatial history, legacy issues, walking to work is not a, an option for many, many people. And South Africa has historical legacy issues like land use, which are challenging. But I hope to show you in a few minutes that you're not unique in that. And you have implementation structures. But to me, there's a huge shortage of operational experience. Operational experience in, in mass transit systems. You have financial structures. But I think we've learned over the last couple of years that oversight is poor. And at the same time, budgets are low comparative to other cities. And I'll show you some of that later on. And you have political structures, which are very, very important. And there's some interference, but then we all have that. Every country in the world has interference from political structures. So it's not unique to, to SA. But you do seem to have a conglomerate of state, power, state, local, and private uh, transport op operators. And more and more jurisdictions I've been working within, we've seen the need for creating strong, independent operational authorities within each city. And yes, that does mean taking some implementation powers from local authorities, so you could call it, rather than a devolution of power, it's coming back to more of a centralization of power. But because transport is so complex and so interwoven and so intricately part of the urban fabric, you cannot have a multiplicity of local authorities trying to implement a system-wide approach um, in one city or one regional area. And again, I'm not going to harp too long on this, but I, I've looked at, there's a number of different worldwide indices that you, can, that you can just quickly go into and look at how you're performing in regard to and in comparison with many other cities. The Deloitte 2018 is one. Now, there's Deloitte 2020, and Deloitte uh, 2020 didn't include South Africa. They couldn't even collect the data for South Africa. But in 2018, under reliability, under safety, uh, under air quality, under many of the measurements that we look at transport, South African cities are well behind. I think it's important to know that, but it's also important to contextualize because we have mentioned earlier that every city is different. Every environment is different. And when you look at um, Cape Town, Auckland, New Zealand, and, and Dublin, Ireland, um, we have different populations, different areas, but significantly we have different gross domestic, domestic products. So that means the amount of money that each individual contributes to the fiscus and to the growth of the country is significantly different. But that doesn't mean that can't change. I mean, 20 years ago, Ireland's GDP, okay, 30 years ago, was very close to South Africa's GDP today. Now Ireland's GDP is on a par with and higher than many European countries. So these things can change and transport's a very important part of the economic growth and activity. If your people can't access good jobs and good education, your GDP rel levels are not gonna rise. Now just going back to the point we raised earlier, when you look at geographical spreads within the three cities I've just selected, and I guess three cities that I'm, I'm, I'm currently working in, um, 
you know, when I worked in, in Trani, we were aware that Chushkin was an awful long way away from Mamalodi. And we developed a system that was essentially connecting the two. Now, I think a lot of us know that there were political uh, issues and there were issues around uh, operationalization and, and only a very short, discrete section of the system was operationalized. And of course, that resulted in very low patronage and, and, and that's exhibiting still to this day. But connecting a place like Shashiguve to the city center and out to Mamalodi is not a task that's beyond us because in other cities like Auckland, where I was working last year, they have a 70 kilometer commute from one end of the city to the other. And even in my own city, Dublin, you know, we've got a 50 kilometer commute, commute from one end of the city to the other. So it's not unique to have these distances to deal with, but your transport solution has to adapt to, and the systems you implement and you put in place have to adapt to um, the distances and the populations they're trying to move and where they're trying to move them to. Now, just a few statistics. So, I mean, we have to have ambitions, and I know in South Africa we have IRPTNs, and within them there are ambitions. So, in Dublin, our ambition is to, is to move 55% of people by sustainable mode, and sustainable mode means walking, cycling, bus, taxi, or heavy rail by 2035. And we're still, we're still a good way to go, but we're moving positively in that direction all the time. Now, we have a budget equi equivalent to, in Dublin alone, of 20 billion rand per annum to spend on this system. Whereas in Cape Town, when I looked up the statistics that I could find, I find Cape Town at 1.6 billion, City of 1.5 billion. And I can well understand the Department of Transport are reticent about putting more money into places like Cape Town, Johannesburg, when they see the systems are not economic, not really functioning, not really carrying the values of people they're intended to carry. Another quick point I want to make though, is that, and I, we all know this, the transport is made up of an integration of systems. So what you see before you here is what we're doing right now in Dublin. And Walter mentioned the fact that BRT systems are changing. And if you look at the top right-hand part of the screen, this is the Dublin, the new Dublin bus stroke BRT network. And essentially this was designed by, well, it was redesigned by Jared Walker. And I think Jared might be with us later on today. He might even be with us now. And um, Jared's been involved in uh, bus uh, reinvention, I call it, all over the world. And to some extent, he has reinvented the bus network in Dublin. And it's been recognized, I think, as Walter mentioned, that the traditional um, hub, uh, you know, um, hub feeder or mainline feeder system wasn't always suitable. But we have key corridors and we have, we have a wide network of buses that have been put in place. And as the strategy unfolds, Rail would become the backbone, but right now bus is the backbone and that would stay that way for the next 15, 20 years. We have a comprehensive rail system going uh, already in place and um, comprised of both metros. I'm actually working on the underground metro system at the moment and um, light rail systems and dark systems. And then when you look at the bottom left hand corner, that is the new cycle network. It's very comprehensive and it's very safe because it's segregated. And over on the bottom right, you see the park and ride network. I, I'm not, I don't want to emphasize any time on that. I just want you to understand that, you know, systems are made to integrate. And the messages we're giving our people are very integrated, they're pictorial, and we're trying to get the messages out around transport, around um, carbon uh, uh, footprint, around uh, land use, and around activity within the street. So bringing all this stuff together. And I'm throwing this picture up because this is Simon from Wooden Road. Um, you know, I drove out here in 2019 expecting to see the REN going up and down this road. The designs were done, the drawings were ready, the construction has started when I left. And unfortunately, it's been taken over by cars again. And there's probably people here who know the answers to that more than I do, but 
This is out near the Grove Shopping Centre, just the junction with Linwood Road and Simon from Whitton Road. It was to be the extension of the Ariane system out to Mamalodi, and it's obviously not in place. And um, maybe people can tell me why. Um, I've picked up headlines from the newspapers, even your ministers are saying that BRT is a white elephant. Why? And to a large extent, the reason why is that the taxi industry are opportunistic and they are doing a great job. But, but they have captured your urban rail patronage. And that's a good thing because right now you don't have the urban rail mass transit systems in place. So South African cities are running BRT services at 110,000 per day. Uh, even in Cape Town, the numbers I'm getting are 40 to 70,000 a day. And really, phase one was to carry 200,000 running out to 400,000 per day. So, I mean, how can anybody credibly put more money into this system when it's really um, draining from the fiscus? So, there's no meaningful return on the 5 billion a year that NDOT are spending currently. And this is something we're here to talk about today. So what improvements are needed? The CEPA mentioned earlier, we need lower cost, more affordable mass transit. Absolutely. And I quite separately came to the conclusion this requires subsidies. Because your people need to be able to afford to get on these systems, to get themselves educated, to get themselves into higher quality paying jobs. And if you contain and maintain the status quo, that's not going to happen. So the minibus taxi industry can be transformed into that very product. There's no reason why Praz or Metro Rail, Heavy Rail have to be uh, competitors of the minibus taxi industry. They can be clients of the minibus taxi industry. The minibus taxi industry can work with them. The minibus taxi industry can be the mass transit bus system if it wants to be. We just have to get bigger buses. We just have to get better systems put in place. We just have to mobilize them. Those guys know how to operate. But of course, they have to be brought into a regulatory environment where they can be regulated in, in a way that is not a cartel operation, but an, an operation that's run by the state in that type of state operational environment under regulations. And there are, I mean, there are successes that maybe on the drawing board that can be highlighted. I know the Malato Corridor is a potential corridor that could be looked at to, to demonstrate a success. So let's put some five-year targets in front of ourselves. Why can't 35% of our mode share be by mass transit in 2026? I believe it's achievable. One million trips in Chwani, Johannesburg, Cape Town per day. Set up a new city transport authority in each city, overseen by NDOT, with legal powers to oversee strategic planning, financing, and regulation. Now, there is a view that before you do that, you better sit down with the taxi industry. And I would kind of contend that should be the case because, from my experience in, in Chwani, um, we brought them in, but possibly too late. We should have brought them in early. You do need to fix your urban rail and BRT infrastructure. You do need to get existing taxi operators involved, and you do need to expand your budgets. So setting up an operations team seems to be an urgent priority because we need to get operationalized what we've got. So in summary, how can we better leverage the minibus taxi asset as well as uplifting the existing mass transit systems to vastly improve the public transport options for all South Africans, while also addressing the carbon issue in transport. Climate action, again, is now the new driving force for change in transport. What can SA Transport do? Again, um, I've picked up a lot of my data uh, on um, information I could get from the internet. Um, I'm making references here to where I picked up some of my data. I think uh, 
the conversation South Africa needs to revamp its new public transport system, uh, unrealistic expectations, unrealistic uh, GCRO provocations. I think that came from um, uh, Jesse Harbour and Rose Breyer. So that's all I've got to say to you. And I hope that today we can summarize our outcomes with next steps and perhaps get together again in the near future that can start deepening our sense of movement and move away from what might feel like a public transport malaise in South Africa into a public transport action, especially the action and activity we had around the World Cup. That's when I arrived in South Africa. Around the World Cup, there was a great action activity around public transport. So can climate action generate that again? Can the minibus taxi industry get involved and mobilize the changes that are needed? It's over to you. Okay, thank you very much, um, everybody. Thank you so much, Rob. Uh, this was extremely interesting. Thank you for sharing what you guys are doing in Dublin. Um, I'm, I'm back if you want me. Uh, yeah, Harry, I'm Walter, back. yes, thank you very much, Walter. <laughs> we're glad seeing you here. <laughs> we, we sort of assumed that when you're back, you will carry on with your presentation after Rob has concluded. <laughs> yeah, great. I'll be happy to. Thank you, Walter. So, Rob, thank you very much. And we're looking forward to the panel discussion of you. And uh, let's now listen to Walter's uh, rest of his presentation. Thank you very much. Uh, is my screen showing there? Just a slideshow view? Yeah. Is that it? Perfect. Okay, great. Sorry about that, folks. My, uh, my computer blue screened rather uncharacteristically. <laughs> anyway, I'll carry on. So, as I was uh, mentioning, the, um, uh, there's been an evolution in service planning, and uh, we mentioned that. Now, part of, uh, of providing a service that sort of operates on a trunk BRT line and then would sort of leave the trunk BRT and move into the neighborhoods, uh, you need a, a bus that has doors on both sides of the bus that would interface with your BRT station on one side and your street station on the other. And fortunately, manufacturers are making more of these. This is just an example of one that China is making. This is from Yutong. Uh, now, the interesting thing about Rayavaya and my city was that they were designed right when this transition was beginning to occur. And in fact, when we were uh, working with the city planning Rayavaya, we sort of realized that we were going to have a really hard time capturing a lot of the demand in the Soweto area uh, without running a kind of direct service and we didn't have budget to build many transfer stations. So Ray Avaya introduced this concept of complementary routes and it was sort of the one of our early steps in the direction of what we're calling third generation BRT. But the thinking at the time it was designed was still very much along the lines of let's bring everything to a trunk station and then transfer to a, a very large articulated feeder. Uh, the design wasn't sort of sort of third generation from the beginning. And Cape Town also has been moving in this direction, uh, as you can see. Well, certainly the the, uh, the trunk route that connected downtown to Al to Atlantis was always something of, a, of what we would call a complementary or a direct route as it left the trunk infrastructure uh, to continue the trip to Atlantis. And as, this, as the services have grown, uh, several new direct services have been introduced that use the that that use the trunk infrastructure through table view and then they jump out and go up to parklands, et cetera. Uh, so the evolution in thinking is definitely in the direction of of third generation, but I would call it 2.5 because the the core thinking was still much around a trunk feeder uh, service plan. Now a few years later, when we were designing the Guangzhou BRT system, we essentially took many of the bus routes that were already on the corridor and we simply designed the system to serve those routes, uh, but we had full uh, BRT infrastructure along the trunk. So this is a picture of Guangzhou. There were originally about 50 bus routes on this corridor and we incorporated about 33 of them. We modified a few others, consolidated some. 
in this way, that, that one corridor uh, is serving uh, about 800,000 passengers a day. Um, some other innovations that have occurred is sort of focused on last mile connectivity, uh, integration of bike sharing and other micro mobility options into the BRT station environment means that people can take a bike, drop it at a, at a bike uh, sharing station and then hop right on. Uh, we're finding a, within about a 300 foot or about 100 meters, it, it really makes that transfer very, very quick. Uh, another thing that's happening is, is just like you're trying to now figure out how to integrate the rest of the, the, the transit systems that aren't served by the BRT into the sort of overall city system. Uh, Bogota went through with this precise process starting in 2012. Uh, they realized that still about two thirds of their transit system was not part of the Transmillennial BRT system. It was still in informal uh, colectivos or minibus or minibus taxi type of businesses that were more or less unregulated. Uh, so in 2012, they, they divided up the whole city into separate zones and they issued gross cost contracts to uh, to companies that were formed of the previous informal operators. And they, they did it so that the whole city was covered. Uh, and, but they were covered under the old route networks. And they, they did have a, a, a modern ticketing system, but it wasn't the same ticketing system that Transmillennial used. Um, the result of this sort of uh, uh, attempt to bring the whole system under at least under government contracts was that uh, the Transmillennial trunk system, it, it still had huge ridership. It was over 2 million by this point, uh, but these, these zone-based uh, mixed traffic services ended up costing the city about $300 million annually. The contracts were not particularly well negotiated. Uh, the routes often were competing with Transmillennial routes. The fare collection systems were incompatible. So when Penalosa took over for the second term, we tried to initiate a process to sort of rationalize the route structure between both the Transmillennial system and the what's called the SITP zone-based system. Uh, but that process really hasn't finished. Um, as Rob was saying, uh, definitely there is an increase in subsidization of public transit systems. Uh, around the world, it's, it just seems like it's an inevitable progression. Certainly in the United States, Europe, China, India, Brazil, former Soviet Union, all these countries have long established history of fully subsidizing public transit services. Uh, you know, if you're getting a 50% cost recovery in these markets, you feel like you're doing pretty well. Um, obviously with COVID, uh, transit operators around the world are really suffering. And this has put tremendous pressure on national governments to sort of bail the industries out. Certainly there was a massive rescue package in the United States, uh, but in countries like the Philippines, the, even the informal guys, you know, they lost so much income that they're trying to figure out ways to save the industry, including the informal industry. Now, nobody simply writes a blank check to informal operators that are operating in some kind of a legal gray area. Uh, so we'll talk a bit about how that might be done in, 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 a, in a bit. There's been a huge area of innovation in fare collection systems. Certainly in New York City right now, you can just take your cell phone, hold it up to the turnstile and the subway system will let you in or, or the bus system. Uh, and it's linked to an account on your phone. This obviously has a huge advantage. I know in, in, in South African cities, it was kind of a headache to find a place where you could buy your smart card to get on the, the Ray of I or the My City system. The card itself costs some money. Um, it didn't integrate well with other systems. Uh, these these smartphone-based or, or bank card-based systems uh, the phone ones, there's sort of two approaches. One, it's sort of, there's a QR code that your phone generates that's linked to your own account. But now they also have systems that are simply NFC. It just means your 
phone or your bank cards just sort of sends a radio signal to the local turnstile or what have you and it deducts it from your account. And there are back office ways of still providing discounts to free transfers and, and distributing money among multiple vendors. Um, more and more uh, BRT or high volume bus stops are being uh, designed in an integral manner to have e-bike, uh, bike sharing, scooter sharing, electric pedicabs. These are being called new mobility hubs. Sometimes if they're out in a less dense urban area, they might have a uh, car sharing as well. Um, these are helping to provide last mile connectivity because it's very expensive for cities to maintain those sort of last mile feeder buses. Some of these systems are also integrating with the car sharing services like Uber and Lyft. In Denver, for instance, you can use your, uh, you can use your Lyft or Uber app to find out the next bus and you can get a discount for transferring and uh, you can pay through the Uber app. So BRT in South Africa has really transformed, you know, what people thought was possible particularly in, the, in, in Africa, it's had an enormous impact. Uh, the South African national government and the city governments, they chose BRT over other alternatives because it was a technology that was developed by emerging economies and, and it worked well in those environments, but it's used everywhere. It's being used in the United States, it's being used in Europe, et cetera. And of course, World Cup was coming, so they needed to build it fast and it was cheaper than building heavy rail. It simply wasn't possible to do. But most importantly, and this is what really sold it to Jeremy Cronin, who was the uh, deputy transport minister at the time, was that it offered the possibility of the empowerment and involvement of the taxi industry, unlike the Howe train, which essentially didn't do anything really much for, for black empowerment. So the system was designed by South African engineers for specifically South African conditions. Now, indeed, the South African project leadership, they took on expertise like myself and a huge team of folks from Colombia and Brazil, but the system was, was place specific design. And um, I think it's very much appreciated by the passengers. Uh, women feel safer, disabled people can use the system. And it was South Africa's largest, perhaps, black empowerment program. I don't think we want to lose sight of these things. Now, it is true that the BRT systems in South Africa are subsidized and much more than we had hoped. But if you compare it to what the subsidy per passenger is for the regular bus services like GABs and, and whatnot, it's still less subsidy per passenger trip. And the how train subsidy per passenger trip is a level of magnitude higher. It's something like nine or 10 times higher. Admittedly, the vast majority of the trips are being managed by the informal minibus taxi industry who are not subsidized other than through the taxi recap program. And obviously we all need to think about better ways to involve them moving forward. The demand was a disappointment. Um, Rea Vaya, uh, we thought we would reach 100% cost recovery. There were very specific conditions. We thought that was possible. Most of those conditions weren't realized, but still 30% cost recovery is a disappointment. The, um, uh, my city's doing a little better. It had gotten to about 50% cost recovery, which is pretty good by international standards, particularly for a fairly low density type of a city. Uh, the demand projections were also a disappointment. Uh, but again, the, the Cape Town numbers weren't quite as off. So what happened? Well, obviously with COVID-19, that explains the most recent downturn, um, but really there were other things going on. I mean, the fact that it took so much longer to build the system than we expected, obviously transit ridership is declining a bit simply because people are buying cars, et cetera. And so the fact that the system was built out much slower than anticipated meant that the ridership was much less than we anticipated. There was a lot of transit oriented development that was hoped for that would develop around the corridor and densify the corridor, almost didn't happen. Um, Uber and other you know, motorization came along, so the general trajectory wasn't so good. 
uh, and we made some uh, service planning mistakes, I would say. We were, you know, it was early days, uh, which allowed the taxi industry to compete with us. Obviously, if the service was very fast and went just where people wanted to go, then it would be very competitive with taxi industry. Um, the ticketing system had a lot of problems from the get-go that really complicated matters. Uh, and the reliability of the system has been an issue. I mean, there's been ongoing strikes. The bus lanes aren't particularly well enforced. The operational control systems didn't work as we had hoped. So all of these things frustrated a lot of passengers. The costs were much higher than we had thought, largely because we, at the national level, there was a decision to not competitively tender the operations. Now, obviously the political situation was such that that would have been a highly contentious process. So it was decided to negotiate the contracts, uh, but this did translate into a 30% premium on the operating costs. Uh, the bus lane enforcement issue increased operating costs, project delays meant we had to go through these interim contracts that ended up being extremely expensive. Um, so moving forward, well, there has been a kind of call from national and I think this is quite good to develop plans for thinking about a citywide transit system. How in the world are we gonna uh, provide services you know, that integrate with the minibus taxi industry? Uh, we need to reassess the BRTs, uh, provincial bus services and the minibus taxi route structure as a unified system. They're currently sort of separate systems that aren't really talking to each other. Uh, so I would say the first step is really to finish at least the trunk, primary BRT trunk infrastructure. Obviously we should at least be connecting the major historical township areas with city centers. Uh, Ray Avaya phase 1C is still not finished. Uh, there's the stations have been sitting on the ground for some time and are being subjected to vandalism. Obviously the system needs to be finished. This is a waste of investment otherwise. Uh, Cape Town, the Lansdowne corridor is under construction and thankfully the N2 Express is gonna restart in November but uh, soon, but uh, maybe it has, I don't know. But uh, there's still no real plan for a connection from downtown to Kailich and Mitchell's Plain. Uh, you know, there's a hope the rail line will be brought back online, but the original phase one quarter was Clipfontaine and there's no movement there. And that's the vast majority of the people. Uh, downtown doesn't have much in the way of bus priority and uh, uh, certainly not transit malls, et cetera. So we could be looking for those opportunities. Uh, I had the opportunity to work in Durban and the, the infrastructure is beautiful there. Uh, C3 is not necessarily where I would have put the first corridor. It's quite peripheral to the city center, but uh, it does serve an OD pair and they should at least be operational. It, should, it was supposed to open in 2018. Uh, C9 is a useful little link, but the, the C1 corridor, which connects Bridge City to the downtown is, uh, is you know, many years off. And, uh, and there's not really anything planned for the city center. I mean, Durban city center is very dense. Uh, there should be a pro, uh, uh, something to do to improve bus and speeds and minibus speeds in the city center. Um, I think it's important to, uh, to take another look at the services being offered on those pieces of infrastructure, looking mo at more third generation service options uh, to expand the catchment area, increase the ridership. Now, the, the first generation, the first phase contracts are going to come up uh, for renewal and under the law we're supposed to be tendering those and it's it is important to really move forward with the competitive tendering process or once again cities will lose control over the timeline when they offer these services and again we'll end up paying a premium that results when you don't have a competitive process uh, i know that's going to be politically contentious but really i hope that, that the compet competitive tendering can move forward. Uh, there should be a lot more attention paid to using uh, integration with micro mobility, uh, bike sharing, et cetera, at the stations uh, to get that last mile. And finally, uh, absolutely, of course, we need to figure out 
uh, kind of new and innovative ways of involving the taxi industry, particularly in that last mile service. Um, there is some very uh, interesting possibilities for subsidizing uh, trips provided by taxis to feed the BRT systems. Um, there's certainly the possibility of issuing either net cost or gross cost contracts to taxi industry participants that form themselves into companies and pay taxes and, and et cetera. They would have to formalize themselves in a way, uh, but certainly they could then be integrated into a system and their routing structures could be harmonized with the rest of the public transit system. Um, obviously, the, there's great progress moving forward to modernize the ticketing systems in South Africa. Very great to see. I certainly hope that cell phone payment, it becomes a piece of that puzzle. Um, there really needs to be an effort to jumpstart uh, transit-oriented development efforts around any heavy infrastructure. It's a real shame. You've got a very high capacity system that's underutilized. Uh, there's not much land development happening. TOD is not an easy thing to do, but uh, so far it hasn't really moved much at all. Um, so those are sort of the, the points I wanted to make to hopefully kick off a lively discussion. And, once again, thanks very much to Harry and the NDOT for inviting me today. Thank you so much, Walter. This was very informative and we thoroughly enjoyed sharing all, you sharing all your knowledge and thank you for working through all the difficulties and the distance. <laughs> we really appreciate that. Um, and we're looking forward to the questions and answers with you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ladies and gents, uh, our next presenter then is a respondent, as Professor Christoph Fenter, as Professor of Education Engineering, University of Pretoria, is also a member of BRT and Center of Excellence by the BREF. Thank you, Prof. Christoph. Uh, thank you, Harry, and uh, good afternoon to everybody. Um, I'm going to, to spend no more than 10 minutes just uh, with a few quick responses to what we've heard. I think this is, this is a great session, and, and thanks to the DOT, I think um, even just from Walter and, and Robert up to now, we, we can see that they are very well informed of, of how things you know, are going here, um, and they put their finger on a lot of, a lot of truths. Um, I, I, uh, want to firstly, um, I think, echo what, what Robert said around this the general sense of, of pessimism, I think, around the public transport system in South Africa at the moment. Um, one does pick up that there's uh, sort of a loss of energy and a loss of momentum that's, that's quite dangerous at the moment. I think it comes together with a loss of, of patronage, right, because of COVID and a loss of funding um, because of uh, the state of government um, finances. So um, I think we need to probably uh, pay a bit more attention to selling the positive story that we have to tell around, around the public transport achievements that we have had to date and make sure that, that in the media and also in government circles, those kind of uh, things um, come out better. Then I, I want to, uh, I guess echo sort of three things that, that have been key takeaways to me from what we've heard already this morning, which I think are really important. Um, I think the first one is that we, we must, even though this is a session on, on, on BRT and IPTN, we must remember that we are not in the business of building BRTs. You know, that's not, that's not our primary focus. We are in the business of improving mobility and access in, in our cities specifically. And we have a much wider set of tools in our toolbox than just building bus lanes and, and you know, segregated stations. Um, and we must remember that. Um, I think the, um, the shifts towards uh, what Walter called the third generation BRT, um, they do sort of provide a starting point. And uh, according to, uh, I think a lot of people that have spoken in this space in South Africa in the last few years, there's definitely, a strong sense that we we don't um, we don't want uh, well that a one size fits all kind of approach towards BRT deployment is not suitable for us. Um, that cities have very different conditions, different densities, different 
distances, um, different capacities, uh, well, I mean, institutional capacities, and we, we need to, to find the right kind of designs and tools to fit those. Um, and I think uh, the, uh, moving towards uh, a much more flexible uh, approach where we probably build less bus lanes and concentrate more on um, uh, lighter infrastructure uh, is, is certainly the right kind of approach. Um, and and, uh, and, I, and I'm, I'm very glad that Kibi also emphasized that as a DOT priority uh, in, the, in the past, in the, in the beginning. I think um, if you look at the kind of numbers that we have and the densities that we have in, in our cities, we, we probably should be not building as much for capacity and even as much for speed, um, given the low willingness to pay of passengers that we have. But to, uh, in, in our case, I think um, accessibility and reach of the system is probably uh, much more important to make it work. And, uh, and, uh, and that, that implies better integration, right? Because we can't expect the BRT system to have uh, this reach all on its own. And then also, of course, affordability. So um, I, I think uh, looking at how we can include, how we can improve affordable access uh, is really key to, to, to moving, uh, moving this forward. Um, I think the second point that, that I also just want to echo, and, and, and again, both, both speakers mentioned that, is uh, the importance of dealing with the informal industry. I think the one lesson that we have clearly learned is that an, uh, we, Dealing with uh, the minibus taxi industry is, is actually key to the success of the formal public transport system. Uh, and I think it's absolutely correct that one big reason why we have had much less ridership on our systems in Joburg and in Cape Town, certainly in Trane, um, is that we have but, but, uh, minibus taxi operators that are still operating in competition to the BRT, even though some in some cases they have actually we've paid them to not do that right so we don't have the kind of control to to um, uh, to make sure that those those guys don't come back and, and compete with the BRT so um, and to me that is really a critical aspect of of any improvements that we want to to have is to come up with a better way of uh, uh, of operating the the formal and the informal system in a more coherent and uh, systematic way. It's not two separate systems because we already know that doesn't really give us what we want. We've tried that, um, that, that can't work. Um, <clears throat> and I think um, the, uh, one of the really positive developments in this, in this uh, respect, and maybe we'll hear more about that in the rest of the day, is um, the, the examples of the Moja Cruise um, initiative in Durban, in Etiquini, and also the Blue Dot uh, system in, uh, in the Western Cape, where there is the foundation that is being laid for the minibus taxi operators to, to learn um, how to come into a more regulated kind of environment where government has a bigger say in what they do, and where they're starting to become, uh, you know, the initiatives are being, sorry, the incentives are being put in place for the operators to actually start to improve their service quality and over time, that can certainly be a way to also adapt their service offerings in terms of routes, connectivity, um, uh, payment systems, and so forth. That would be really uh, critical to, to improving the integration. So I think we should, um, we should really look carefully at what can we learn from how that is working um, and, and what's not working and, and, and try to, to build on that kind of thing in other cities as well. I think the third, uh, the third issue that I wanted to raise is one that I think um, COVID has taught us over the last uh, two years. And that is that um, we must uh, make sure that we don't get distracted by um, a lot of uh, nice, nice ideas and, and, and even um, good ideas which work uh, in, in various parts of the world um, but that distract us, us from the core business of what public transport is trying to achieve here. Um, and, you know, we're trying to put bums on seats and we often fail in doing that because we take our, 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 our eyes off the ball of, of providing a good, reliable, 
public transport service. You know, buses that are well maintained, that run on time, that don't break down, um, that uh, um, are running when and where they should, uh, and and also of course running where and where people are and where people want to go. So um, it's that, and then it's also the sort of provision of a safe and a secure environment for passengers to be using the system. If those things, if the really basic things are not in place, then um, it doesn't help us talking about digital apps and you know innovation in cardless uh, um, contactless ticketing, um, micro mobility, and even TOD and the, these kind of things. We need to uh, to make sure that the quality of the basic product that we provide um, doesn't get left behind. And unfortunately, one sees it sees that happening in some of our BRT systems where quality um, oversight is really not there. Um, and we do slip in quality, uh, even on what we have uh, built at huge expense up to now. Uh, and once we've done that, then we can build on, on that to, to expand. Well, not once we've done that. We should be doing that in any case on a continuous basis, looking at the quality of, of the basic core service and build on that to, 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 to then expand and provide better, better services. Um, and um, yeah, I think I'm going to stop there. Thank you very much and um, looking forward to the rest of the day. Thank you, Prof. Christu. Really appreciate it for this objective view. And uh, we hope that you also be part of the questions and answers. Right, ladies and gents, we're going to give the South African IPT and cities now opportunity to uh, to give us some comments. And uh, Ibram Sudat from DOT promised to facilitate the session. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks. <coughs> thanks, Harry. Thanks for the... Uh, uh, hi. Thanks. Thanks to everyone. I'd, I'd like to just... Uh, open the floor to uh, any of the cities uh, to uh, make some initial comments, in particular, uh, City of Schwane, Cape Town, Joburg, especially were mentioned because the two presenters had, uh, uh, you know, historic knowledge of those cities. And uh, Rob Kelly did throw out the issue, and it's a good question. My colleagues and I have discussed that as well at that time. Uh, in dismay, but uh, Simon Fulmutan's uh, bus lane link to Mamalodi is actually being used by cars. Uh, probably similar around Atterbury as well, uh, around Midland Mall. Uh, so, City of Shwane, anybody wants to uh, take a quick step, a couple of comments? Uh, this is just a, you know, just a, a two-minute, uh, you know, initial. Uh, ideas uh, to throw in to the pot? Yes, they can just unmute themselves and then we will recognize them. Uh, anybody from the cities? Okay, so uh, if, if no cities want to take take up the offer, I uh, I noticed uh, some of the veterans also were in here earlier. Uh, people like uh, Andre Frieslaw, Bob Stanway, Bill Cameron, uh, and others who I probably didn't see. Uh, whilst we're waiting for cities to throw in a few, I think uh, my plan B was to ask any of the those who were here from the beginning to uh, make some initial comments, uh, feeding off the presenters or any of your own own thoughts. Uh, can I start picking on some people just for a, to get things going? Uh, uh, Andre, you want to make some comments first?
Hello, everybody. Can you hear me? Oh, yes, loud yes, we can. can. Well, uh, thank you, Ibrahim, for putting me on the hot seat. <laughs> um, I think it's been um, very refreshing to, to sorry, hear. Sorry, maybe, maybe just a quick little introduction. Okay. Sure. Your veteran status. Yeah. Okay, so um, Andre Frieslau, um, uh, I worked um, on the My City system, the Phase One A, and did a lot of the infrastructure design for that, um, and assisted with operation of that um, in up to in, from about two thousand and seven to about two thousand and fourteen, a seven year period, and we're involved in all all of the the work from essentially the city of Cape Town. Civic Station all the way through to Atlantis. Um, and um, yeah, I mean, I think it was uh, particularly exciting to work on, on these projects. Um, and there was a huge impetus given to us by the 2010 World Cup. Um, and um, everyone was working together and there was huge cooperation and uh, we achieved an enormous amount. And it was extremely exhilarating and extremely exciting. And, you know, it started to, to give everybody in South Africa a glimpse of what quality public transport could really look like. And still today, I'm extremely proud of, of the work we did as, as Walter and others have admitted, we've made mistakes in trying to indigenize um, uh, the, the, um, the BRT systems into South African conditions. Um, I think we've learned a lot. I think we've been able to, to chew on that. And I think, you know, going forward, we can must incorporate a lot of that learning, but I, I still believe that quality public transport systems in our cities is, is the way to go. And um, politically, it's not been a very um, not, not been a very easy pill to swallow. And I'm very also ha very happy to hear that other cities around the world are not breaking even. They are having to um, subsidize public transport. So you know, I really I really think we've lost a lot of uh, impetus in, in the country. Um, it's been extremely frustrating as, um, as a participant in this environment to, tr to watch how everything has slowed down. Um, a lot of us are extremely passionate about public transport. We wanna see our cities develop their systems. We wanna see um, you know, that happen. And um, it's really been um, terrible to see the dismantling of the rail system and um, how we almost seem to be have been going backwards. And in some cases where systems are built, we haven't, haven't been able to opera, operationalize them. So yeah, I really, I really am very encouraged that we as, as, as a group can try and work out how we can move forward. Maybe not with the original ideas that we had, but to incorporate all these new ideas um, and, and try and move forward. But uh, my plea would be that we would we'd pick up the pace um, because I think, you know, this, the pace we're going at now, we really are not going to be able to make the kind of progress we need to make and um, that we're seeing being made right across the world. I think we have all the expertise here. We have the talent. We have um, um, uh, the people sitting in this room. So um, my plea would be for us all to, uh, to embrace some of what we're hearing today, to take it on the chin, and let's try and move forward. So those are just some of my thoughts. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, Andre. And uh, uh, if I can ask Bill Cameron to say a few words, if Bill, if you uh, all the way from Australia, if you in the right time zone awake still. Uh, and then I'd like to ask Ben Maseko from Joburg, uh, Lisa De Beer, who's worked on uh, Rayavaya, uh, Madeleine Engelbrecht, who's worked on Rayavaya, and a lot of NMT work as well, just to be on standby. And then after that, we'll open it up to, to anybody else. I think if other people want to uh, uh, also send very pointed uh, questions in the chat, Harry will monitor that and he'll put it, put it to the panel. So, uh, Bill, are you there? I'm here, yes. Uh, can you hear me? I have unmuted. Yeah, loud and clear. Everything's fine. Go ahead. Uh, and welcome. Uh, 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 greetings to all of you. It's uh, so nice to be back with so many familiar old faces. Uh, well done, Harry. I think you've done a great job in getting this lot together. Um, Thank you. One thing that, that strikes me uh, quite significantly is that all your speakers, Nosipo, Rob, Walter, Christo, Andre, they all seem to assume that the cities are immutable, that they are 
staying the same. They, so public transport becomes the blinker that stops us looking wider at what's going on and what the long-term potential is. And uh, to my way of thinking, having been out of this game for five years now, and, and by the way, <laughs> when I was in it, I, I felt that the most important thing was the support that we received from the political classes. In the case of Rio Baya, it was Mayor Masondo, and in the case of Cape Town, it was Mayor Helen Zilla. And I think we've lost that, and that's perhaps one of the reasons why the momentum went out of public transport. Anyway, my, my, my point would be to say, you know, the world is changing rapidly, and uh, there are two things that sitting at a distance from, from Sydney strike me is the effect of climate change and what climate change is going to do to the future of our cities. And secondly, what we've experienced, all of us recently, through COVID. I've, I've, I'm no longer working in transportation. I've become a part-time uh, teacher looking after my grandchildren's uh, remote learning. And in that two years, I, I've learned quite significant amounts about how we can actually decentralize most of our activities. And to me, I think that really is the longer term solution uh, rather than congregating and concentrating in, in congested cities, and uh, particularly city centers, even, even the dispersed city centers. Um, you know, I sit here in, a, in my daughter's uh, office with a fantastic screen in front of me, which should be showing my face, but is not. <laughs> and another one on the left-hand side, and my daughter, who works for an American firm, Unices, spends all day in this office talking to her mates in uh, Asia Pacific, in, in, in America. And to me, that, that is the way the world is going, that, that we need to actually uh, make all our contacts much more remote, which obviates the need for travel. And I'm serious about this because I, I, I can see the advantages. If you look in Sydney, the CBD has a massively high office vacancy rate at the present. And there are a lot of people who just don't want to go back to work. So what I'm doing is raising the issue about cities. Where are we going in the future? Will we be able to decentralize and reduce the need for such high mobility, which, which has many, uh, as you all know, negative uh, effects. The other one on the climate change story is, of course, we, or you in South Africa, lost a wonderful opportunity when a certain person by the name of Elon Musk emigrated. I mean, that guy knows all about mobility. Think Tesla, think putting people into space, think um, putting people on the moon. And one of the things that I think is really very important and is very neglected in South Africa is education of the type that he had. He was a Pretoria Boys High scholar. Admittedly, he's a bit of a genius and very bright. But, you know, I can recall when I was in South Africa, there was a TV teacher by the name of William Smith. This guy was brilliant. He used to give maths and science lessons. And I've often heard children 20 years later talking about how wonderful he was. And, you know, if one had been able to package that sort of education and put supervisors in large halls and spread the, the sort of quality education that South Africa really needs, then I think a lot of the problems that we're experiencing would, would have gone away. So, I'm, I'm less of a public transport um, advocate at the moment than of an advocate for better education, for looking sideways and opening our eyes and seeing what opportunities there exist in the world as it evolves in the post-COVID and new um, energy efficient era. So that's, that's my contribution. And once again, very nice to be with you all. And I, I will be saying good night very shortly. It's late here.
Thank you. Thanks a lot, Bill. Yeah, there'll be a recording as well, so you can always access later. Uh, ben, and I noticed Eric uh, Matswane is here also from uh, the Joga taxi industry and Piotrans. If, if you want to make a quick short comment, especially on some of, uh, I know the tendering of contracts is becoming a hot button issue. Uh, any quick comments from your side, Ben or Eric? Uh, hello, Ibrahim. Uh, because I'm a bit busy, oh, I, I, I started typing my, my comment. Uh, so you'll read it from my, my okay. comment there. Thank you. Okay. Ben, you want to make any comments from the City of Joburg side? Okay, we'll get back to Ben. Uh, Lisa De Beer, you want to comment? Uh, Jackie Walters, you can be on standby as well. I just uh, spotted you. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah, go ahead, please. Um, yes, I just, think... Just a, quick, just, a quick, just a quick introduction. All right. Um, Lisa De Beer, I used to be with Gib, um right from the beginning when the first Phase 1A came on stream um, before the World Cup in 2010. And um, we built the sections or we supervised the construction of the sections in the inner city. Um, I know very controversial. A lot of people hate it. Um, at the time, the one-way pairs were just about the only place that the huge stations would fit that we were told uh, is the size to, to, to design for. Um, today, I'm, I haven't been in close contact with the RT operations for a while, um, but what I know from our recent work in the inner city is that the flexibility with the system design, um, I think is a major challenge. Um, we have the huge, degradation and, and basically collapse of the rail system, which now has to be planned for some somehow. And where I think it might be feasible to scale up some of the trunk services a lot to cater for this demand, it's not happening. Um, and instead, even that huge mass transit demand to the inner city is, is, is being taken up by the, the small transit modes. Um, so yeah, I think the challenges, the contracting challenges, the operational challenges is where we should put in all our focus. Um, my, my second comment is also just uh, um, lamenting the, the slow progress of phase 1C because I think if one were to integrate um, Alexandra into the, into the system and then on the northern side, by longer extended feeders, um, Ivory Park and those areas, we would certainly have a much bigger um, ridership than, uh, than, than, than we have now. I think the, the lack of network creation is, is to this day um, severely hampering the effective operations. And, and it's basically, it's money sitting in the ground there um, going to waste. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Lisa. I think excellent points. So I think between Bill and you, you're kind of challenge, challenging us on both sides. One is on flexibility with regard to the need for travel. Absolutely. And secondly, uh, flexibility with regard to being nimble in terms of service plans, operation, mm -hmm. procurement, etc. So I think, I think, and, and I think those are spot on. So uh, we must keep, keep those flags flying and try to come up with answers. I'd like to uh, ask um, Madeleine, I think, if you want to make a comment, and then there's Jackie. And uh, then maybe, Harry, you can go through a few questions, and I'll hand back to Rob and Walter. Hi, hi Ibrahim, Ibrahim uh, Madeleine uh, Ingobrecht, yeah. Just a quick intro. Hi, Madeleine Ingobrecht. I'm a transport consultant. I'm also independent nowadays. I used to be at Arab. Um, I'm I feel a bit like an imposter amongst all these amazing public transport planners. And I just wanted to congratulate you on putting the session together. 
whoever was has been involved. I think I just feel that Bill put a bit of the nail on the head with saying where's the political world that was there around World Cup. And Rob spoke about the malaise in public transport there is. And in 2010, there was so much activity. So it's a, it feels to me as if we sitting around the room are not always the right people. It should be those that actually have the will to make things happen and make change. And um, the other aspect is really the importance of then integrating with the minibus taxi. The work that's been done by the Western Cape on the Blue Dot Taxi has been amazing. And it hasn't taken months and months to plan something and put something significant together. It's been just a people, a, a group of people who wanted to make something happen has then put together this Blue Dot Taxi and created a very different environment for the, the hot taxis operate. So, these things are possible if you want to do it. Um, I, I don't know. I don't think it's technical. I don't think we lack the technical skills or abilities to, to do what needs to be done. And funding is, of course, an issue. But if you if the will is there, somehow money is found, isn't it? So I'd rather um, pass on to Jackie or somebody else who can, who can add value to this conversation. And just some, some of your NMT work, anything you want to comment on there? Yeah, well, I think the big thing is that we have to appreciate the cost to the user and then the cost just of the systems. And we tend to forget the NMT is once it's once it's usable, it's a free, it's a free service, you know, it's free. So for the people who has to use, who have to use um, the VRT systems or whichever systems, it's important that we put a lot more focus on NMT and just all around, not just in the station areas but just wider put it all out into the station I mean it's, it's I don't know it's, it's to me it feels like I'm stating the obvious but it's, it's still not a topic that's receiving the right amount of attention that's my view yeah, thanks and I'm sure Rob can, hard. <laughs> yeah I'm sure Rob Rob can give us a sense and maybe Walter of how to uh, re-jumpstart some of that again in a way that doesn't make it like a little niche you know uh, poor people's kind of uh, alternative, you know, as it got, I remember in 2016 when the EFF uh, in Joburg went after the bike lanes, but uh, I'll, I'll leave that there. Uh, 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 Jackie Walters, do you want to chip in with a few comments before I give it to Harry and then the panel? Thank you everyone for putting me on the spot. <laughs> uh, thank you also to the speakers, I think, for excellent presentations. I think many of the concerns I've had over the years in public transport, so, you know, being at the University of Johannesburg in our post retirement, and still working in the industry. Um, I have a number of concerns, and I want to take one step back. Um, I, I think we haven't got the fundamental building blocks in place for public transport management initiatives in South Africa. It's very fragmented. The, the planning is fragmented between three spheres of government. Uh, the funding is fragmented, maybe a across government departments vertically and horizontally. And if, you have, if your funding is fragmented, it draws specific agendas and specific expenditure programs. So you, you never have proper integration of public transport systems in our urban areas if that remains fragmented. And for me, I've, had, I've, I've always said this, we need transport authorities. You know, if you look at successful systems throughout the world, um, the systems integration, coordination, initiatives, planning, management is driven by transport authorities at the metro level or just above the metro level. We don't have that in South Africa. If you look at Jonah's work, it's all over the show. We don't have a coordinating institution, although you have a, some sort of a transport authority now. They're not effective at this point in time. But this is the lesson I think we should learn from overseas experiences that we can really transfer to South Africa. So we need transport authorities necessary expertise the strategic tactical and operational level and the legal level for that and because we don't have that i think we are in a way leaderless uh, at the local level uh, and the provincial level in terms of where we are going so the fragmentation that we have that we've been experienced for years it's just been perpetuated and we can talk about many of these smart systems nice systems but there's no coordinating body or integration and thoughts around this it may be at the national level, but certainly at the provincial and local level. If you look at the high 10 tenders that's just been put out, eight tenders, it doesn't talk to new technology or innovation or green transport, any of those things and environmental issues 
but we think for the same point that we've seen now the COP26, for instance. So this relationship that we have nice to prevent from local to the constitution and current function is really problematic. And uh, at least this further fragmentation. The other area I think that's, that's very important is that we have, we have a flat line of funding for public transport. Where we've seen examples uh, in, in, in England and, and Dublin and so on, where so much money has been put into the systems. The systems won't respond if we don't put adequate funding in. And we need adequate funding, sources, sustainable sources, predictable sources over the years. As we know we have to serve our urban populations going forward, keep people out of motor cars into public transport systems. If you look at the Sydney one uh, that was mentioned just now. Very good systems, very well integrated, one ticketing system. We are nowhere there at this point in time. So, you know, I think we need leadership. And I mean, who stands out in South Africa as the leader or leaders in public transport? I don't know of anybody, and it's so fragmented in terms of, in terms of thinking. If you look at rail, for instance. Metro Rail used to transport 700 million, or generate 700 million passenger trips per annum in 2007, 2008, around there. It's maybe down to 10 or 12 million passenger trips at this point in time. The whole system is in disrepair. And I think it's because we, it's been mismanaged. We know that there's been state capture and all those things, um, vandalism and theft. But if that business was within the realm of a transport authority that we found, in most parts of the world, London being a good example, all over France, Europe, North America, Australia, all those, I don't think it would have happened because we would have had the expertise there, the skills to actually manage the system. And this is where I think we should really focus our energies to get these transport authorities going, facilitate them with the skills that they have in South Africa. I agree we have the skills, and then address this fragmented planning, management, and funding of these systems. So that's my penny's worth for today's discussion. Thank you. Uh, great. Thanks, Jackie. Uh, I see. Let, let me hand straight back to the panel. Maybe uh, Walter, Christo, and then uh, Rob, I'll give you the last word. Walter. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Ibrahim. Uh, I guess um, I would like to, you know, call attention to uh, some of the questions that were raised on the chat. Uh, it was very nice to hear from Eric. Uh, who we worked very closely with uh, as uh, as we were moving to open Rayavaya. Uh, you know we're in a, we're at a very tense time because uh, those uh, phase one operating contracts uh, are going to uh, expire, and that NLTA requires us to uh, to go to competitive tender. And I do think that that's that that pressure is really quite important because. Uh, the, the competitive tendering process will, will certainly give Piotrans a, a huge chance to, to, to win the contract again. But, you know, as Eric pointed out, the enforcement of that contract has been quite weak. And, uh, you know, there might be other industry players that might be willing to step up to the table. And uh, that competitive pressure is absolutely important to improve the governance of the companies that are operating the system. If they think that they've got a lock on it, uh, then, then they won't reform and the performance hasn't really been so amazing today. Um, so, so I would just like to call out uh, those points. Um, many other great points were made and uh, I, I'd leave the floor to others. Uh, thanks, Walter. And we'll pick that up in the next session as well, uh, as well as uh going forward. Uh, people feel free to keep uh, sending in comments. Uh, Harry will monitor them. And if we don't get through them, we'll pass them on anyway uh, after the session to uh, to everyone who can answer. Uh, Christo, any quick uh, further thoughts? Uh, Ibrahim, um, I, I, my attention was just drawn to the few suggestions there around um, opening up infrastructure to, to other uh, public transport vehicles. So not having um, necessarily bus lanes or BRT lanes, but uh, having lanes that can be used by any kind of public transport um, vehicle, including informal ones, small ones. 
I think there's really something to look at there. Um, there are good examples of that kind of thing um, around the world. Um, it's not necessarily a new idea, and they have been working in, in many places, although not in our kind of conditions in sub-Saharan Africa necessarily. Um, so yeah, I think there are lots of innovative ideas one needs to think think about, and and maybe they can also help us to um, to move forward with uh, with this process. Thanks, Gusto. Rob, you got the last word. I think uh, COP, I think climate change pressures. Some people have alluded to that. Uh, NMT. How do we actually make something critical mass from the start? Uh, and anything else? Over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Abraham, and thanks thanks for all that that positive feedback we've heard uh, from people. There's a few themes coming through to me in my mind. Um, one is, and I think Prof Ventra men mentioned this, but it's, it's um, you know, we need to be flexible. You know, we, need, we can't be dogmatic about what the solution is for individual cities in South Africa. So flexibility is important. Perhaps focusing now on light infrastructure rather than heavy infrastructure is, is and I think Madeleine made a point that NMT, once it's built, it's there. It doesn't cost much to operate. Well, you have to maintain it. Um, another point that came out, which is very important, I think, is fragmentation. I have not worked in any city in the world that was successful in implementation, integrated systems without having a coordinating authority of some form. I mean, even in Dublin in 1996, we started off with a co coordinating authority coordinating the operations of seven different local authorities. And we had limited success. It really became powerful when the government made it uh, an authority as opposed to a talking shop. But you will not get success and you will not sort out your fragmentation without some form of coordinating authority of some sort. And the last point I heard coming through is operations. I think there is a lot of possibility with what you've got there. I mean, the, the existing infrastructure that's there can be much better utilized. And um, there is a very, uh, you know, a taxi industry that's, that's opportunistic. And those guys can be made to uh, mobilize in different ways to use the existing infrastructure. So I think you need to think about this. Flexibility, fragmentation, and moving towards lighter infrastructure uh, uh, in the short term. Of course, the heavy infrastructure like the rail has to be fixed, but that sounds like it's going to take time. So I would start focusing on those three themes, flexibility, operations, and, and, and the fragmentation problem. Thanks, Rob. Sorry, uh, I'm not uh, monitoring the hands. So I was told there are two hands. One is from Gershwin and one is from somebody else. Harry, you can, uh, uh, if we can allow them, then we could close with them. Uh, Gershwin, over to you if you're still there. And, Hi, uh, thanks, Ibra. Uh, welcome back. I think you qualify as a veteran as well. No, I'm too young for a veteran, <laughs> Ibrahim. No, I, um, I think I, I made my Ki comments. Kibi, Kibi called you a veteran when she told me your hand was up. <laughs> no. So I made my comments in, 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 in the right, but I think uh, uh, to, just, to, just to, to, to underline three critical things, and it was so great seeing Bill on the screen. Just, uh, I, th I think Rob made it, or uh, Prof Walters made it. I can't now recall. But we must not start this discussion with BRT in the opening sentence. And then when we're talking about public transport planning, uh, we usually uh, start with the technology BRT. I think that point uh, is a big lesson learned for, 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 uh, for our cities, that we must start with a network plan. We must start with understanding the demand in your cities. You must understand where people are moving and then you come up with various technology solutions, and then you go through various uh, evaluations to choose the best, uh, the, the best mode. Um, the, the second point is the big lesson learned about private transit. Um, and I think that point is made clear. Uh, private transit should be involved in the network planning and not an afterthought to force them as a feeder. That must be involved from the beginning um, and then the third big area, which we as, as both environment professionals often forget, we design and we build and we operate it for the first six months. But thereafter, um, the contract management and the operational management has been a nightmare uh, for, uh, for the operating cities. And we need to, to, to learn from the lessons learned during the operational so that we can 
ensure that the designs of next contracts um, are, uh, are on par. That's my only three points. But my, my last point, looking back, I don't think any mistakes has been made. I think it was critical lessons learned. Um, I think the, the BRT, not I think, I know the BRT project has elevated the role of public transport. So now we have public transport where, where uh, it's not just a service for, um, uh, for the captive, but anybody can use public transport because we elevated the role of public transport, which is great. And we just need to get, uh, learn from the lessons learned. Thanks. Thanks, Goshen. Was there one other before I close? Yes, there were two, uh, Mohammed Lockhart and Andrew Barker. Okay, go ahead, please. Uh, Mohammed. Yeah, hi. I've just got an extended comment. I just want to say that, uh, just to add on to what, what the previous speakers have said, so much, so much of the problem is just a lack of integration and the siloed approach to this entire thing. And it's, it's a lack of integration of land use as well as transport. Our first point of departure should be NMT, and that's been completely just overlooked in terms of, of, of system planning, in terms of planning the IRPTNs. How are people expected to travel to the stations that they're supposed to head off? And that leads into my second point, where most public transport professionals and transport professionals in this country have this very car-dependent mindset or come from a background where they exclusively use cars. And that, that's, I, that, that's what I think is the original sin when it comes to planning public transport systems in our country, in South Africa, where most of the people in our country use minibus taxis, use buses, walk to work. So it's just a lack of that uh, engineers are not policy makers, they are implementers. And forgive me for, to, to all the engineers on this call here, I think that that's what the problem is. Um, yeah, that's all I'll say for now. Thank you. Thank you, Mohammed. Uh, Andrew Barker. Thanks, Harry, and thanks for putting together today's speakers. They have been very refreshing, very honest, and I think very realistic in many ways. I'd like to pick up on three things which have been mentioned in some ways. Um, the, the, the fact that the taxi industry is an asset has never been recognized by South Africa. They are seen as a pariah, and it's time that we saw them as an asset and what they can bring to transport systems. Um, we spend billions on importing buses and technology when we could have spent that money on upgrading the taxi industry. And it's a plea I've been making for many years. And it's time that we really started to look at this in a serious way. The second one, which uh, Mohammed mentioned, is the land use site, also one of my bugbears. Everybody looks at transport and they look at transport and routes and things like that, but they don't look at integrating land use. And it's a chicken and egg situation, but it's time we started to work together as land use planners and as transportation planners to try and make these systems work. And the last one, I believe there's an asset that's opened up which we need to rethink and think differently and think smart. And that is the Prasa routes. They are gentle gradients. And I believe they have an opportunity to introduce other modes of transport and supplement a mass transit system, a new mass transit system. We cannot afford to rebuild what we've had. And we need to think smart. We need to put some brains together and start to turn those root assets into commuter transportation movement systems. And I think there's huge potential there which needs to be realized. Thanks very much, Harry. Thank you so much, Andrew. Valuable comments there. Uh, ladies and gents, yes, obviously we're running a bit out of time, but we're recording all the comments here uh, right in the chat room. And we have a little bit later on, again, the questions are answered, so then we'll get to them. Um, I think you'll agree, maybe we can take a short, just a five minute body break and then we'll continue with the, the second half of the program. But first, let's give a big hand for all our panelists this far. Excellent job done. Very informative. Thank you so much for all your support this far. And hopefully you can still stay with us for a while.
Okay, everybody, let's start moving back to our desks. Right, now we're starting with a very interesting, another interesting uh, section of our event. And we're talking about IPTNS and the minibus taxi industry. And our first uh, presenter this afternoon is Chris Cost, ITDP Africa Program Director. He's going to talk about the national lessons on paratransit transformation, ITDP. Thank you very much, Chris. Great, thanks, Harry. I'm just bringing up my presentation and then we can start. Okay, great. So uh, I'm Chris Cost and I'm gonna talk about some case studies in paratransit and public transport reform. And I'll be focusing on the cities of Kigali, Jakarta and Dar es Salaam. So I work with the Institute for Transportation Development Policy, ITDP. Uh, we're a not-for-profit NGO working with cities to implement sustainable transport systems. And I'm based at our office in Nairobi. So I'll start out with the Kigali case study. So this is focusing on the reform that led to improvements in the overall city bus system in Kigali. So to take us back to the pre-reform era, you know, before 2013, when these reforms really took off, most of the service was provided by 18-seat minibuses. So these were the Toyota highest vehicles, you know, similar to the old taxis in South Africa um, before the recap program. And they they were known as Toyorana, um, you know, in reference to the fact that people were really getting squeezed onto the vehicles, you know, the, the fact that these vehicles were carrying 18 people each and not 14, as, you know, we have in many of the other cities. Um, the vehicles were owned by individuals and individual owners who decided where and how they wanted to operate. And there's a lot of concern about the, the crowding and insecurity and chaos that was experienced at the bus stops and terminals. And, and this had a, uh, especially affected women, children, um, elderly, you know, people with disabilities who were not able to access the public transport system um, under these circumstances. It, it was very hard for people to travel around. So there are some early reforms um, starting around 2008. So there, there was an effort to uh, form this public transport as association in Traco. Um, that was not very successful. Um, the one thing that did happen was uh, the introduction of queues at terminals to, to try to rationalize that system so that uh, you didn't have this, you know, uh, uh, every person for himself or herself um, system where, uh, where not everyone could get access to the vehicles easily. So to try to tackle these challenges, the government of Rwanda set about developing this public transport policy and strategy. And it, it was drafted in 2011 and formally approved by the cabinet in 2012. And it was done by this technical team that was comprised of the Ministry of Infrastructure, Mininfra, City of Kigali, COK, and the Rwanda Utilities Regulatory Authority, or RURA. And Rura is basically the, the authority that now uh, oversees the public transport operations and, and also taxi operations in the city. So I think what's you know, notable about this policy is that it, from the very early days in this process, it, it set out a clear vision for where the government wanted to go. So um, you know, the, there was an admission that the government needed to step up its capacity to manage the sector, you know, that, that there needed to be um, you know, professionalization of the regulatory agencies. There is also a desire to consolidate the public transport operators, um, that the, you know, individual owner structure was not tenable in the long run. And, and there was a vision of having these public limited companies with large bus fleets that could operate under contract with the government. Um, there is also recognition of the need for dedicated road space for public transport. And it also you know, reflected the need to have explicit measures 
um, to restrict the use of personal motor vehicles, so especially through better parking management. So this, this you know, set the overall vision for this reform process. And at that point, a steering committee was set up um, to, you know, that had both the, the government agencies and also private parties um, that took the process forward. Um, so from, you know, from 2013 onward, the city of Kigali really led the process through the mayor's office. And, and this was supported by Mininfra and also had political support from the PM's office. And there are a few uh, major changes that happened. So the first thing was that the, the minibus associations that were there um, formalized in, into the, this, uh, agent, this entity that's known as RFTC, the Rwanda Federation of Transport Cooperatives, um, which later changed its name to Jolly Transport. And, 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 and so that company was one of the three operating companies that would come to run the public transport. Um, the, you know, the steering committee was actively involved, you know, helping to convince the, the owners to join the process. The many owners were skeptical in the beginning, and so it, it took time to convince them. And then alongside RFTC, which was formed from the, the, the existing operators, there were two other companies that came up um, through, through other investors. So there's Kigali Bus Service, KBS, and Royal Express. And in, in August 2013, that's when the government signed the initial operating contracts with these three operators, with RFTC, KBS, and Royal Express. And those went for five years, and, and they've, they've since been extended, and I'll, I'll get into that uh, a bit later. Um, the, the city was divided into, uh, into four zones, so RFTC took two of them, and the other companies took one zone each, and their services overlap in the CBD where they come together. Um, and so basically these are zonal contracts and, and all these companies are operating on a net cost basis. So, um, so under this original arrangement, they were not receiving subsidies and they, they had to make do with the revenue they could receive from the fares. Um, but there were forms of support that the government extended. So one was to uh, give backing for the loans so that these companies could purchase uh, high, like higher capacity buses um, and, and the government also waived the import taxes. So that made it a lot easier to, to bring in these buses. Um, and the, it didn't happen overnight. So, uh, you know, the highest vehicles continued to operate in the initial period, but by now they're all gone from the system. So they're, the whole fleet is a combination of these Utah buses, like what, the one you can see here in the photo. And, and also uh, there are a lot of uh, Toyota coaster buses that are in operation. Um, so these buses, uh, at, at least the Utong fleet has better access for people with disabilities, so there are ramps in the buses. Um, and then the, there were a lot of improvements in the bus terminals that, that came in alongside the, the uh, improvements in the service and, and the fleet. And there are regular inspections that happen through um, you know, COK, Rora, and also the, the Rwanda National Police. So to give an idea of the current operations, so we have a fleet of about 380 buses um, of varying sizes from a capacity of 30 to 70, um, 390,000 daily boardings, although this has been up and down during COVID. Um, and because these buses are all operating mixed traffic, the speeds are very low. So 10 kilometers per hour in the peak and, and 17 overall. So there's clear room for improvement there. But there, there has been a, a really tremendous transformation in the service. And um, you, know, you can see here the, like one of the terminals in, in the downtown. Um, there, there are issues with regularity that you can see from the queues and, you know, and just a, a lack of service during the peak. Um, but it, it, you really get a different feel using the system um, compared to you know, a lot of other cities um, in the region. The, the newer buses are you know, much more ergonomic, so they're, they're actually fit for urban service um, compared to the, the highest uh, minibuses. And, and so you have uh, you know, proper space for circulation and, and, and standing room inside the buses. Uh, one of the other notable reforms is the introduction of the electronic fare collection. So the, the fares, fare collection is managed by a company called AC Group. Um, but this AC group reports to the three operators rather than to the government. And, and so, um, yeah, so they, they basically pass through the, the fare and, you know, and retain a service fee for doing that. 
And the, the current fare structure is uh, it's sort of distance based in the sense that each route has, uh, has its own fare depending on the length of the route. But if you board somewhere in the middle, you have to pay the full fare for, the, for that route. Okay, you don't, you don't pay for the, the actual distance you travel. Um, so that, that's the current setup. So especially for, you know, for shorter trips, it kind of discourages use of, of, of the bus system. Um, so the, the smart cards came in in 2014 and, and you know, eventually they expanded to all three of the operators. So these days there's no collect cash collection um, nor are there conductors on the buses. Um, but there are attendants at the bus stops um, who, who can help you reload the card. And if you, if you really don't want to pay for the card, what they'll often do is like they'll reach in the bus and tap their card for you um, so that you can board. So that's how the, you know, at least from major bus stops, the, the system is able to handle the like single trip journeys to some extent. But most people have smart cards and that's how they travel on the system. Now, as I mentioned, the, you know, there's some limitations like the, the GPS devices that are there um, are not feeding data um, that can be used for, for the service planning. So that's, that's one of the shortcomings. And because the, um, you know, the, the government, although the government um, approves the fare collection facilities that are set up, they have an indirect relationship with the fare collection operator. And, and so that makes it a little bit harder to use the information. Okay. Um, yeah, now what's the impact on drivers been? So this, this was a pretty big shift um, from, you know, being on the target system to having fixed salaries, um, you know, in, in the range of 110 to 180,000 Rwandan francs per month, um, and, and also medical insurance. Um, the, the working days are, yeah, right now the way it's set up is they, they work 15 days, so there, there's a shift every other day. So you work for 18 hours and then you have a full day off and then you work another 18 hour shift. Um, the, the drivers have had access to bank loans, um, especially through RFTC. Um, there, there are other facilities they've been able to, um, to gain. And, and you know, because the not all drivers were absorbed in the system because of the move to larger vehicles, um, they've been able to accommodate some of the drivers in, in the stations and depot operations and also in the garages that are run by the companies. So um, during COVID, you know, like, like all the other cities, the, the public transport in Kigali was severely impacted. Um, the, you know, there, there have been a lot of uh, restrictions. And in response to this, the government committed to provide some subsidies during the COVID period to the tune of $29.3 billion. And this was a, a, you know, represented a real mind shift change in the country because up to that point, there was a real resistance to providing subsidies for public transport, and and so I, you know, this really, um, you know, op opened the door to a broader discussion about how to really ensure high quality and reliable service um, in in the system, and and also an opportunity to think about. Um, you know how the government can start to demand better service uh, to the extent that these that this financing support is being extended. Um, now the the city is currently studying how to move into the second generation contracts. So um, you know because of COVID, the the contracts were not immediately um, uh, renewed for you know after the initial five year contracts expired. So the the city has still been kind of operating under the previous arrangement. Um, in, in expectation of, of conditions improving. Um, so there were some key goals that the government set out. So they wanted to have reduced waiting time. So, you know, guaranteed reliability on all the services, um, expanded fleet and capacity, having a, a fully distance-based fare structure so that you actually pay for the, the distance that you travel and you don't have an incentive to use a motorcycle taxi for a short trip, um, having real-time customer information, and eventually introducing dedicated road space in the form of bus lanes and BRT. Um, there's also discussion now about moving to a gross cost model, um, although that you know, hasn't been conclusive yet. And you know, we're waiting to see what the final decision will be. But what happened when the, when the tenders were originally put out was that none of the operators qualified um, to, to meet the higher service standards that were there under the second generation model. 
And so the government is now looking at how to take this process forward and how to ensure that the operators can step up to provide this better service. And you know, what kind of a business model is going to be re required to actually make that happen. Okay, so that's Kigali. And now we'll get into a second case study about Jakarta um, and zeroing in on the feeder services to the BRT. So as you may be aware, um, Jakarta has a very extensive BRT, um, the, the most extensive network in the world. Um, there, there are 13 BRT corridors, 248 stations. And, and as you can see in this map here, the, the city has gone to a full third generation uh, network the way uh, Walter described in his presentation. So there are direct services, um, there are feeders, there, there are a lot of services that now comprise this network and, and have been able to um, you know, extend the reach of the trans Jakarta system to a lot more people in the city. Um, and you can see the, the microtrans routes in, in this aqua color. And that's what we're going to be focusing on on this case study. So all these feeders that are, you know, really, um, you know, local routes that are going into the neighborhoods to provide service. And, and just for folks who may not be familiar with the system, you know, here's an image of, of line one in the Trans Jakarta system. Um, and it, what's really been impressive in, 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 in the system is that the the agency has really made an effort to innovate over time. And you know, one, one of the things they've changed is that at, at many of the stations that originally only had footbridges, now they've added this at-grade access. Um, and so you know, thinking about both infrastructure and services and how they can be improved to reach more of the population. So zeroing in on the, the on-code feeder services as, as they were known before the reforms, um, they, they're really critical for, for local access. So they, you know, they're, they're really tiny vehicles. They're, they're just four meters long and they, they carry about 11 passengers. And, and so they could you know, go into narrow winding streets in, inside the kampungs and other local areas. Um, and like a lot of our cities, the, the fleet was individually owned, you know, pretty poor quality vehicles, um, a lot of destructive competition on the street and, and unsafe driving. And importantly for the BRT, the fare was not integrated. And, and so there's a lot of incentive for people to use other modes and, and not transfer to the BRT because you had to pay two fares. Um, and then, you know, as you can see in, in the image, like lack of infrastructure and you know, lack of properly designed terminals to, to facilitate this interface. So the, the government looked at uh, setting out these key reform principles um, you know, enhancing service quality, so making sure that the, you know, whatever change is made actually improves travel times and affordability for passengers. Um, also looking at service efficiency by rationalizing the route network and avoiding duplication. And, and then building government capacity to manage the transport services, you know, the same as, as in the Kigali case. <clears throat> and looking at how to professionalize the public transport industry through the minimum service standards that the Trans Jakarta has set out for all operators who want to join the system. So, um, you know, in, in the early days of this reform process, it took, typically took about two years. So starting with the preparation of the financial model and business plan to understand the basics of how the system would operate, um, building the trust and confidence over the next six months, um, then proceeding with capacity building for the operators and then in the second year, actually, you know, getting to the tough negotiations on the cooperative agreements and the per kilometer payment terms. Um, and then finally implementation and, and, you know, training for drivers and other um, operators to, to launch the new service. So, um, you know, how, do the, the, how does the new operating model look? There, there are five to seven year operating contracts. Um, operators are paid by kilometer with incentives for good performance. They're, they're now required to have depots um, so that they can do proper maintenance and cleaning of the vehicles. And they're, they're, in these minimum service standards, there, there are several aspects that the, that the Trans Jakarta Agency is now monitoring. So the vehicles have onboard GPS, so the agency is able to keep track of the, um, the speeds you know, to make sure that drivers are adhering to the 50 kilometer per hour speed limit to ensure that they're actually stopping at designated locations and, you know, and stopping at all the points where they should be picking up passengers and training on sexual harassment and other 
gender issues so that operators are, are able to interface with their passengers in a better way. Um, the, the staff receive salaries and insurance. So, you know, so this has improved the, um, you know, the, the labor conditions in the industry. And for, for the vehicles, so uh, again, similar to the Kigali case, this, the vehicles have, have been changing over time, but this was not done immediately. So uh, to the extent that the existing associations had vehicles that were less than five years old and in good condition, they could continue to operate with those vehicles, right? So the main change was to have the fare collection and GPS systems installed, and, and then they, they could join the new, um, new, new service. But over time, they've been replaced, and um, the, the newer vehicles have air conditioning, which is very important in the, in the climate in, in Indonesia. So th those are some of the key changes. And here are the results. So um, yeah, I mean, now the, the payment is all by smart card. So there's a, an integrated fare, um, which is a, a slight increment over the normal BRT fare of 3,500. So you pay 5,000 for the integrated fare. And there are now over 2,000 vehicles operating on 70 routes in the system. And they're, they're, they, you know, pre-COVID, they were carrying uh, over 230,000 passengers per day. And what you can see in this pie chart is that 28% of the, the passengers in the system are actually getting in on, on these vehicles. So they're, they're, really, um, they're, they're really critical now um, as a, a feeder to the BRT. And I think there are some lessons for that um, when we're looking at the South African BRTs and, and how we can better integrate other services. Great, so in the remaining time, I, I wanted to introduce the, the final case study, Dar es Salaam. And here, I'm actually gonna talk about the, the BRT um, because I, you know, I think oftentimes we get hung up on the, the, the physical aspects of the BRT and, and, and you know, leave aside the service provision and the operational parameters in the, in the systems. And the fact that in many cases, BRT systems are just as much in need of uh, reform in the business model and, and the operating practices as um, you know, systems that we might perceive as being more informal. And that was the case in, in the DART system. So the, you know, the BRT has, has really been a breakthrough for service quality. Um, it's, it's currently carrying about 160,000 passengers per day. That's, that's down from, you know, it used to be upwards of 200,000 pre-COVID. And it's, it's resulted in a huge reduction in travel time. So from two hours to 45 minutes one way. Um, so it's really expanded access to, to jobs and, and other opportunities in Dar es Salaam, you know, where the, the, the congestion on, on all the, the four main radio quarters in the city is, is extreme, you know, and, and that's, that's uh, been able to, to uh, change with the introduction of the BRT. But coming to the business model, there have been a lot of challenges. So um, the, the service is currently operating as a, a net cost contract with a single operator, it's known as UDA RT. And the, the operator has a, a relationship with, with the, the government agency, DART, that, that oversees the service. But everything involved in the BRT operations is basically handled by UDA. So from the fare collection to the fund management to the station management, everything goes through the bus operator. And, and so there, the, the result of that has been a you know, pretty limited fleet, um, very poor service reliability, especially in the off-peak period, you know, because the, the operator has the incentive to minimize the service to, to what's economical. And there have also been consequences for, for driving safety. And because the, the fare collection uh, equipment was, was retained by the operator and there, there are some issues in the, in the contractual terms, the, the DART agency does not have access to the, uh, you know, to the data, um, you know, generated by turnstiles and to know where people are boarding, get the OD patterns. So this is something that, that needs to change. And now the DART agency is moving to fix those issues by issuing a gross cost contract with per kilometer payments. Um, and they're, they're basically hiring a second bus operator to supplement UDA RT. And the, the new tender is by kilometer. And the, once the second operator is hired, then UDA RT will also transition to a per kilometer uh, payment arrangement. 
And the new model will have independent fair collection to ensure that there's transparency and, and that you know, the, the government has the ability to enforce the service levels that are set in, in all these contracts. So, you know, just looking across all these case studies and, and other cities that we've been studying, um, it, it's really important to change the business model if we want to get different results on the ground. You know, we have to avoid treating the symptoms, um, but actually look at the underlying incentives that the operators are facing if we want to really tackle issues like road safety, um, overcrowding on the vehicles, lack of reliability, um, and gender equity. Um, we need to identify sustainable funding sources to support the gross cost model. So we have to look seriously at things like parking fees. Um, you know, that's something that Kigali uh, is doing right now, um, you know, studying how to improve uh, fee collection and revenue generation from the private vehicles so that we can transfer that revenue into, into public transport. Um, and then finally, we have to have dedicated road space if we want public transport to be competitive with personal vehicles. Um, otherwise, we're, we're going to see a continuing slide in, in ridership in favor of uh, private cars. So uh, we, we've compiled uh, some of these lessons learned and, and, and other materials about the bus reform process in this quick guide to bus sector modernization. I invite everyone to visit our website and, and download it. And thanks a lot for listening, and we can take more questions later. Thank you so much, Chris. This was excellent. And I'm quite sure people would like to engage if you did in the questions and answers. Thank you very much for all these case studies. We're learning a lot from you. Thank you so much. Ladies and gents, our next presenters are Javier Kajau. Uh, Javier, I don't know if you recognize your surname there. Um, he's the manager direct, director of Apex Black Consulting. And then we have Darko Skrabinsek, he's the member of Future of Transport. And they can to talk us about lessons from IPTNs and minibus taxi inclusion. Thank you very much, gentlemen. Do we share presentations from our side? Yes, please, uh, Darko, if you've got a problem, then I can do it from my side. Okay, I think Javier will go first. Uh, Javier? That's fine. Okay. Thank you, Javier. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Javier Cajiao. Um, I'm from Colombia, from Bogota. I was involved in the in the Transmilenio system as from 2000, the year 2000. Then I came to South Africa in 2010 to assist the taxi industry in the um, Riavaya as part of the um, of the Biotrans um, management team. Okay. Uh, look, I, I am not a transport engineer. I'm a mechanical engineer. I do specialize in operations, in how to run operations. Okay. Um, my views are basically on the experience that I had in South Africa of challenges or things that actually we found when we started to do the implementation here in South Africa. Uh, I assisted some of the cities in implementation as part of, uh, as part of the different teams uh, in, in Johannesburg, in Tuane, in, in Bloom, in the um, city of Cape Town. But as I said, my operation, my, actually my experience is more about the operational as such, okay? Uh, what also what I want to say here is that there's certain consideration that actually needs to be made when it comes to the, 
uh, migration from informal to formal operation. Okay, one of the initial approaches that actually we experienced when we got to South Africa is that actually the, the idea was actually to replace the traditional operators, the taxi operators with, uh, with taxis. That was like the initial um, assumption. Uh, one of the things that actually we found is that when it comes to the traditional operation or, or, or the taxi operation, uh, one of the things that actually surprised us quite a lot is that uh, the way that they operate is quite an organic way and is highly adaptable, meaning that actually they can make changes uh, from one day to the other when it comes to, to the operation. Uh, one of the things that actually it assists them to do that is that actually they don't really have a centralized um, control center, but each and every single association, so each and every single area works in a different way. Okay. Uh, sorry, Harry, I just want to ask you if you can see, everybody can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Yes, Javier. Yes, Javier. Yes, yes. Yes, we can see it. Okay, one of the, if you compare that with the formal operations, meaning like the BRT or other bus operating companies, basically any given change requires some planning. It takes time to do implementation. Everything needs to be properly centralized. And in a way, when it comes to the operation or, or the implementation agent, uh, there's a lot of red tape that actually needs to be cut. Uh, when I'm talking about red tape is proper SOPs and uh, policies, procedures that actually needs to be followed to do any given implementation. Uh, but what I want to say here is that one of the lessons learned from the taxi operations is that being organic and being an adaptable organization doesn't mean that actually they have chaos, okay? Uh, that chaos, it can be seen that there's some chaos from the systems planning point of view. Of course, there's a lot of issues that needs to be addressed. But the reality is that actually we need to apply lessons learned when it comes to the formal operation to understand that the, the way that we need to formalize the operations needs to be more dynamic and it needs to be more um, in contact with what we need to do in the day to day. Uh, the guys on the ground, the taxi guys on the ground, they are more in contact than anyone else on our side. Remember actually that we guys, uh, we are basically in an office on a daily basis. We can plan, we get information. Our inputs are based on the quality of our inputs. However, if we don't have the right inputs, we might want to have uh, some challenges on the ground, especially when it comes to the implementation. We can have a really nice... Uh, design a really nice plan. However, the implementation is not successful because there are certain factors that were not considered, then we're going to face uh, issues on the ground. Something that actually needs to be considered is that when we work together with the traditional operators, actually we can achieve better results. We can achieve synergy. Uh, one of the things that actually we found over the years is that when it comes to the systems planning, uh, the taxi industry somehow were isolated uh, by means of not actually having a, a, a really active role when it comes to the planning. Okay, There are certain issues, for instance, when we started in Soweto, where actually there was a really nice system a plan regarding a specific uh, route that we need to follow, only to realize that when we went to the ground, the bus didn't even fit in the street. They were, it was just way too narrow. And, and when we chat to the taxi operators on this regard, basically they said that they were not consulted at that stage, that there was someone that actually was doing the planning, but actually they were not consulted, okay? So it means that uh, the, if we need to apply the best practices of people on the ground, okay? Uh, I know that actually most of you, we are engineers, we have degrees, but the hands-on, um, it is important. If we don't achieve, if we are not actually open for us as professionals to be empowered by the taxi industry, our outcomes of any given model that actually we're going to do, it might be a little bit skewed and it will not be able to fulfill 
actually the need that is on the ground. So it is important to do that, meaning that actually we still have silos, we still experience some silos, that the tax industry, they have information that is quite uh, important for the implementation. However, sometimes it's not considered by the system planners or by the implementation agent to, uh, to actually uh, be part of, of, of a better result. So synergy it is important. Uh, and as I said, don't be afraid as a professional to be empowered by the taxi guys. They have a lot of knowledge that they can give you guys. So don't be afraid of that. When it comes to the upskilling and capacitation, uh, in my experience, actually, the upskilling and capacitation needs to work both ways. It's not only about uh, empowering and upskilling the traditional operators, but it's also to upskill and empower the, implement the implementation agency. Uh, basically, if you have um, a government official, a city official, or a muni municipal official, they also need to be upskilled and they need to be trained on how to run the, the system. Uh, somehow what we found right now as we speak is that there's a lot of uh, um, MOUs around the country that actually they're running the system on behalf of the cities where actually the cities were not properly empowered. So the same way that the cities needs to be empowered, there's also a need for upskilling and skill transfer to the taxi industry. Uh, these guys have been running their own business for years and uh, babysitting is not what is required. What is required is actually to work with them together, not to do the job for them, but actually to work together. That is what actually real empowerment is. That is one of the things that I found in the past 10 years. Um, and it's important to work together. If we wanna to move to a integrated transport system, uh, we need to stop uh, isolating uh, each and every single one of the main stakeholders on this report. Uh, guys, my presentation is quite short because I'm sharing this time with uh, Darko. Now Darko is going to present on this side. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm trying to share from my side. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, Kerry, can you please share from your side? Uh, I think uh, it's, I, I, I actually recently upgraded Google. No problem. Okay. I'm just opening it up quickly. Thank you. Thanks, Farid. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, my name is Darko Strebinsek. I'm from uh, Future Transport Consulting, consulting engineering company in South Africa, specializing in transportation planning and engineering economics and management. Um, and as a, as a company and, and professionally as, uh, as, a, as, a, as an engineer, I have been involved from the uh, first days of implementing the first phase uh, uh, in Johannesburg, phase 1A, trying to assist uh, predominantly the taxi industry in understanding this uh, concept of transformation, um, and as well as the second phase of the, of the of phase 1B in Johannesburg. And for the last couple of years, we have been trying to assist the uh, Rastenburg uh, municipality and the taxi community in Rastenburg to reach some kind of a transformational uh, stage. Uh, so I'm also gonna carry on. You can open all these bullets. Uh, uh. Um, so I think the 
all the speakers or many speakers today in the start of the session have um, made references to many aspects of the, of the public transport planning, implementation, policy uh, uh, methods, and surely uh, we understand that the planning and implementing transport systems and public transport systems cut across many spheres of our lives. And it's not easy really to, it's a fairly complex way how to do it and how to do it economically and feasibly. Hence, uh, I guess uh, uh, somehow we need to categorize the, um, the problems, issues, challenges, expectations at different levels of planning or policy uh, development by the way, I also would like to say that um, for the last two to three years, I've been part of the team developing and preparing the first uh, public transport subsidy policy in South Africa for the Department of Transport. And certainly exposure to that uh, process has uh, given another dimension in terms of understanding the, the, the context of the public transport and transformation matters uh, in South Africa. So I have made some couple of notes, basically based on experience, that um, what has transpired and what less lessons perhaps we learned and some lessons maybe we still haven't learned and we are still learning them. And uh, yeah, I'll try to share some of those. Uh, I think one of the presentations earlier has said that uh, uh, there is about 5 billion rand investment annually, but there is not adequate returns. Surely we need to understand how do we actually base our viability and feasibility um, analysis. Um, my personal opinion and professional opinion is that uh, this kind of a transformation effort is, is a long-term process and we need to look at it from a different viability assign, uh, assessments perspective. Um, perhaps maybe just to add um, essentially what outcome of this trans uh, some of these transformation processes as they have been presented or, or approached in South Africa so far means that the traditional operators who accept to form the new companies and get into the new systems, in fact, they are departing with their operating licenses. This essentially means that the government is taking over a lifelong ownership of that license, which basically, how do we really price that? And how do we really put it into a viability and feasibility perspective? As also some speakers, and especially I think Dr. Hook said, this is the significant socioeconomic uh, program. Uh, it, it affects uh, local communities uh, quite deeply. It's not about only taxi operators and drivers. There are kind of a, the economic value chain in um, local communities that depend on uh, traditional operations. One of the things that we're discussing with the taxi industry as part of the subsidy development policy is how do we actually um, treat the traditional operators? In essence, they are small business small business setup, small, small business activities, and somehow entrepreneurs on their own. Uh, question is, how does that conflict uh, with the industry where they actually set up their business? Why don't we want to have small business set up in a public transport service when we actually crave for the small business development in the country and economy? So that I think is something that we need to be clear about, and I guess there is a conflict, okay. One of the key matters and key things in key uh, uh, considerations in this tr uh, transformation matters is a uh, actual daily and weekly cash, li cash liquidity with traditional operators. It's a very significant factor in their operations and their business models as they operate at this stage. And for them to understand and accept different um, a pro business model approach is not an easy task. Uh, and also the cash liquidity is obviously is a, is a huge factor in terms of the, of the, of the set current setup and in, in terms of how they would uh, accept the new business model setups. 
On the other side, uh, we, as, as we are more, many of the, of the participants are coming from the planning and perspective and basically we know that the transportation planning is a part of uh, urban and spatial development planning as an integrated basically a development planning in the communities and uh, without government being in control of the transportation systems it's very difficult to to actually plan efficiently to implement plans i, I think that's where actually the conflict comes in now that as, as much as we all praise the taxi industry in terms of how they operate and how they serve the society and community, their current setup is a, to some degree or to fair degree in a conflict to the industry in which they operate and from the transportation planning and development perspective. Harry, we can carry on. Uh, these transformation solutions, as we experienced, uh, they are quite uh, large, they are considerable, and in, in most cases we need the cooperation of various stakeholders from the government sector, usually national treasury, tax authorities are engaged, we have those experiences in a few of the um, uh, projects in, in Johannesburg and I think in Cape Town as well, where we had to have a certain specific uh, tax uh, directives and uh, and the ways how to deal with these transformational uh, uh, solutions. Um, as we all know, in South Africa, we have a number of projects. I think uh, some of them have been implemented. And in those instances where they are implemented, despite the challenges that they are facing now from a different perspective in a corporate world, in a corporate setup, Seemingly, the majority of them are satisfied and they are excited about the possible expansions uh, of these kind of opportunities. One thing that is for sure, okay, maybe one thing that we have to also mention when it comes to this kind of a corporatization of the industry. I think for the many years when we spoke about corporatization, at least we understood the perceived corporatization to be formation of the companies and which, 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 which would uh, automatically means that they are kind of uh, um, aggregated in a certain way. But the latest um, proposal by the government when it came to the COVID related uh, uh, um, funding that, uh, uh, that, that they proposed to provide for the taxi industry relief funding came up with uh, conditions that every operator has to actually register a PTY and tra transfer their licenses and their vehicles to the uh, PTY setup. Now, that, bring, that, that brings uh, another dynamic what corporatization actually mean. And, and, and I, I'm not sure if there is a big difference of them operating as sole proprietors in a way that they operate now, or if they if they all register PTYs, I don't think there will be a big difference in terms of the corporatization as we perceived and, and thought uh, in, the, in the past 10 years or so. So I think uh, another drive that is being there is that um, it actually comes, is coming back after 15 years or so is basically to form the cooperatives at the, in the taxi industry, the different levels being primary, secondary, tertiary cooperatives. My personal opinion is that any type of corporatization and aggregation of the industry in a certain corporate level would require some dedicated professional support in terms of the transformation as, as well as in terms of the management and setting up of systems and transfers of skills. Without that, unlikely we can achieve uh, a decent, uh, decent transformation uh, outcomes. Um, Okay, that's basically what what the second last bullet was 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 talking about. And maybe there's a, as the as the last statement. Uh, in principle, these kind of um, efforts and these kind of approaches are possible. I think we, especially at the planning and policy level, we I think uh, should agree, and we have no doubts that it should make economics economic and urban planning and development sense in the medium to long term time frame. Although the one big factor is that 
given our experience is with the timelines, uh, it takes quite a number of years to reach the outcome of a certain project or certain phase in a specific uh, cities. And to some degree that, uh, that basically indicates that there is no quick returns from a political perspective. And we know that the political cycles uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and the elected political leaders and representatives in, in the communities would obviously like to have these kind of political returns within their mandates, but that's usually, that's, that's hardly possible. And it has to be politically matured and one as well to understand this. Thank you very much, Harry. That's uh, from my side. Thank you, Darko and Javier for removing the blue sky <laughs> that we can really understand what's happening out there. Um, we really appreciate it and I'm quite sure that they will have some interesting discussions and questions and answers. I'm just quickly preparing our screen again. Here. Ladies and gents, our next presenter this afternoon is uh, Justin Kutsia. He's the Chief Executive Officer of Go Metro, and he's going to talk to us about towards innovative business models to utilize minibus strengths in the IPTNs. Thank you, Justin. Cool. Thank you, Harry. Um, lovely to see everyone again, um, virtually, hopefully uh, in person very soon. Uh, so I'm just going to try and present. Just uh, let me know if you can see my screen, Harry. We can see. Yes. Okay, fantastic. Good. Um, yeah, so hi, everyone. I'm Justin Kutsia, um, CEO at GoMetro. Um, also um, newly announced, I think earlier this year, is our joint venture with the Ascendal Group um, for a strategic advisory um, business, which spans uh, um, 10 territories, um, four continents, about 60 professionals. So we're working uh, South Africa, UK, US, Latin America, Hong Kong. Uh, very, very exciting um, business. So um, yeah, thought I'd just um, give a slight punt there. But um, today I'm really going to focus on a question that I've been thinking about for the last few months, which is what does an electric minibus mean to South African transport? Um, and what will the impacts be if we are to electrify the minibus fleet, what are the opportunities and, and what are the challenges? And what's interesting is um, the questions we're grappling with are, are not, again, just uh, unique to South Africa. Uh, this picture from this um, project is a project we're busy with in Buenos Aires, um, a, a city with something like, I think, 12 to 18,000 buses. I think it's, it's the most buses in a city outside of China right now. However, there are still areas in the city that are very poorly served, um, particularly in the outskirts. And um, even in the, in the CBD, there's a few um, areas where the streets aren't wide enough for large buses. And so we're busy with a uh, minibus uh, project, introducing minibuses, um, even in one of the biggest bus cities in the world. So the role for the minibus, I think, really is more of a modal um, conversation um, or becoming a modal conversation than necessarily a, a formal or informal um, conversation. In the interest of time, I'm going to skip the intro video, um, but it is on CNN. And um, if you just Google Go Metro, um, you can you can see a little bit about us if you haven't heard of us. And I, I think um, it's always a challenge when you start presenting at the end of a session. I think um, every speaker going ahead of me has pretty much said what I wanted to say today. Um, so I'm <laughs> I think I'm going to echo a lot of sentiments. But in preparation, you know, I just what jumped out at me with, with this statistic is that we, we are spending enough on transport systems um, as a benchmark with um, um, regions, two times to four times more in, in similar regions. Um, but are we really getting the, the, the true benefit? And I think um, my sense is um, having um, you know, a new entrance to this field, you know, I've only been working in it for the last 10, 12 years. Is public transport getting better? And I think reflection today, we all feel it uh, slipping out of our hands somewhat. And uh, before I go on today, I just want to, you know, just reiterate, I have massive respect for everyone on this call whose names I recognize, um, old, old friends and colleagues. We all wake up every morning as professionals to make South Africa a better place for all. And so 
Um, if any of my comments are um, you know um, perceived negatively or cr critically or disparagingly, please um, you know do, do do take it where it comes from. That I do have absolutely massive respect for everyone who wakes up every morning to make South Africa a, a better place. But we cannot ignore the fact that our country is burning. Um, we have reiterated, or have we? Have, I mean, a lot of this has been mentioned before, um, more from the lens of public transport. But I really want to start from July, July's unrest, as well as um, the attack on commuter rail and the ineffective response of the state against um, um, this this attack. And so, you know, I think we were all shocked, horrified, and shaken in July when we saw those sometimes tragic and sometimes um, yeah, unbelievable scenes coming out of um, Durban and Gauteng. Um, and so I think the first thing to say is if we want public transport, we need public order. And so from our perspective, you know, we need rule of law. And so if we do not have capable, competent enforcement penalties, a strong arm in the state, then we, we, we simply don't have a platform to, to even begin to discuss investment reform and, and change. Um, that's not me as an engineer, that's me as a citizen um, um, stating this, this view. What was interesting though, and a silver lining I could say, coming out of July's unbelievable scenes, is that I now view the minibus taxi sector as an informal arm of the state. And so we talk about the minibus taxi sector formalizing, but actually if, if the state's powers are moving you know, further and further away from um, necessarily being capable are in delivery at a local level, then surely the minibus taxi is potentially taking up a role already um, that the state is leaving behind. You know, in July, um, there was this procession of taxis driving through Nelson Mandela Bay saying, do not loot, do not vandalize stores, um, defending businesses. There were many scenes around the country in response to the uncertainty that this unrest brought where I would argue that for a few days in a number of communities, the minibus taxi industry was the state in terms of enforcing um, law and order, you know, con controversial statement as that might be. And so the question I, I'm left with is, is when we think about the minibus taxi network, the industry, the association and the structure, we really should be thinking of it as a local development partner. And it, I think it, it echoes what um, the, the previous speakers have just said, which is sit in the room and talk to the industry about what's needed. Today, I'm not going to address the bus contracting, bus subsidization, minibus coexistence. I think um, there are, that is a key issue and, and, and one that I don't necessarily know has been addressed today or will be addressed today. And um, I'm certainly not going to attempt to address the fact that we do have subsidized bus contracts. We have, do have incredible competence in bus operations sitting in the, in the, um, in, in the bus operating companies or in the bus, you know, traditional bus companies. Um, and we have this minibus taxi um, industry that's growing um, and that is agile, flexible and, co and competent. That coexistence, I believe, is a synergy that could make um, South Africa um, um, a marvelous place to move around in. What I am going to just reflect on before moving into the you know, questions on technology is, yeah, you know, I think South Africa has moved through a few paradigms. Um, and so if I was to place just two axes here, where there's a very state interventionist centralized approach to government and governance versus a free market open facilitation approach as a state as a facilitator. And then there's the perception of, well, is this operator, this paratransit operator, this informal operator, a nuisance and a temporary nuisance that we can just eradicate, eliminate, steamroll, roll over, move, move aside, bulldoze, or are they here to stay? And no matter what we do, this industry will just bounce back and will just find a way to keep moving people um, and keep participating. And so when you kind of think of these four, you know, these axes and you, you place the strategies that we've adopted with regard to the minibus taxi industry, you find, well, we, we first you think, well, let's ban the, the, the paratransit network. And I think that was, you know, in, before the 80s, that was kind of the attempt um, before deregularization. Um, and let's just have ban, ban the thing completely, eliminate it, push it to the fringes um, before steamrolling it. Now, we know that that is simply not feasible with uh, 100,000 vehicles on the road, 500, you know, 400, 500,000 um, um, direct and indirect employed people, um, and a massive lobby group, which essentially, I think, was the one sector which um, resisted, successfully resisted government's COVID regulations um, that were not in their interest. 
do we then accept it as is and we just try and regulate it and we create huge barriers to entry and i think this was the attempt with regards to setting up associations that must approve licensing the challenge here is that if you don't control that barrier to entry uh, approach then suddenly you end up with gross over trading um and and vehicle presence when all you need is a letter from the association who collects fees by the way so is incentivized to grow numbers to um, get a license when you have a pre um, that is potentially have such an enormous backlog that you received a photocopy or a staple of your receipt for paying for an application five years ago and that's what you've been driving around with as an operator um, these are the realities when it comes to you know taking um step two you, you, you really need to have demand and supply surveys, regulations in place. If you then think about maybe step three, well, let's um, intervene as a state, but treat them as a partner. That I think is what we've been trying for the last decade to say, well, we're gonna create such a compelling economic opportunity to join a VOC, to join a BOC, that we're gonna um, just um, incorporate the informal um, system into formal operators. Well, I think we're still sitting at the negotiating table three, four, five years later, fighting over a pie and the portion of a pie on operations whose wheels don't yet turn. And so um, a large part of the backlog or the kind of how we feel stuck and my, from my um, you know, limited lens is we've been negotiating something which doesn't exist, which is, you know, bus operations rolling out. But what if we, but I know a number of you know, specialists have been advocating for this, this hybrid system, incremental implementation and something that cooperates with the state. And I think, you know, when we reflect on the last 10 years progress versus the next 10 years potential in, in zone four, where we have state as a facilitator, paratransit operator as a partner, this is where the potential to see action and unlock progress um, will, will sit. So with that lens in mind and those paradigms in mind, what are our options? So we, we can continue to try and try to form vehicle operating companies, and there will be places where that is required, but there are capacity constraints. We, we, you are then signing up to a, you know, an endless negotiation with no real end in mind and prioritizing this activity over wheels turning and people moving. Perhaps there's a potential in the taxi operating company concept. Um, Cape Town, city of Cape Town has a policy um, which um, I invite everyone to go and read. I think it was adopted by council in 2018 or 2017. And it sets out how to create corporates and structures that um, require strong management leadership and um, you can then start engaging with the industry. You know, I think from my pers perspective from the outside as well, the, the Blue Dot Initiative, it's the corporate, like in, in inverted commas, the corporatization, but at least the structuring of the industry, not as a representative body, but as a business or a organization that can engage that has led to a lot of the um, um, success and the rollouts with regards to red dot, blue dot and, and the like, and potentially other incentive um, programs, you know, missed that opportunity to engage with an entity, a structure, and still um, I'm engaged with operators on an individual basis, and therefore diluting the um, strength of incentivization. That leads us to then these incentive schemes. So we've seen Moya Cruz in, in, in Etiquini. We've, we've seen the blue dot. You know, I'm sure there'll be more in the works soon. Now, it's really unaffordable to pay every single taxi to drive nicely. Um, you're potentially creating more externalities. Pumping money into a system that hires hitmen to take out competitors is not a good idea um, at the best of times. So it is important to proceed with caution when we talk about incentives and um, um, dishing out um, um, largesse to the industry. It needs to be tied to a clear strategy, a clear roadmap, and um, clear clear conditions. Um, I think um, the, the the initiatives are showing progress. Um, they're in creating an enabling ground, but certainly, I mean, if, if anyone does the calculations on a matchbox. Um, this is not the way that uh, mass and scaled reform takes place. Or we could just have it in Indaba, and then next year we can have another Indaba, and then the following year we can have another Indaba, where we can meet, we can discuss issues. I think there's a place for more engagement, more dialogue, and more talking, but I think that's all that we potentially um, sometimes do. And so um, I think it's important to vent and talk, but um, at some point, everyone has to roll up their sleeves and, and, and do something um, and bring about change. 
And so when I look at the options available to us, I really come back to this concept of this true local partner, this true local development partner. So let's let's outline how that can potentially look look whereas, as we talk about electrification. So I'm of the view that going electric or going zero emission, you know, it could be hydrogen, could be natural gas, could be whatever, but going to and changing the emission mode here absolutely presents itself as the next opportunity for that impetus, that push. A lot of funding is going to be coming into this space, looking for green solutions. Decarbonization is going to become more and more urgent and more and more prevalent. And it really does present itself as that World Cup catalyst that I think Rob was speaking about earlier. So let's dive into that. And I, as I say, I've been thinking about this for quite some time. So let's just talk about what that looks like. So bringing in a vehicle that has a new energy source, a new uh, potential form paradigm, it's going to change the relationship between the association, the owner, the driver, national, provincial government, city passenger. Everyone uh, uh, has a new, a new role and, and, and a, new, a new benefit. Firstly, it's going to um, increase the market potential for ex the acceleration of renewables, facilities, infrastructure. The elimination of diesel is a massive economic incentive. It, just by eliminating diesel, you're introducing an operating subsidy. The impact on the balance of trade for South Africa in terms of importing fuel, or any African country for that matter, in terms of spending foreign currency on importing fuel, massive national geopolitical impact um, at scale. Now, what about load shedding? Um, well, well, we'll get to that in a second, but I think there's, there's a fantastic report that's just been released on paratransit and energy reform. I have the reference I can share with you. But ultimately, you know, if we think about, we spoke earlier about today there being a transport network. Well, there's a transport network and there's now an energy network and those two in the next five to 10 years are going to become intertwined. And if we get this right, electric vehicles can be a catalyst for solving load balancing and anchor load for re renewable generation um, increasing the resilience of the power system, as well as then cleaning up our air and decarbonizing our transport. And the amount of international focus on this is significant for us to um, pay really close attention to that. But what about load shedding? Um, I think the, someone mentioned earlier today, the, the jury's out um, on that fact. Well, no, the jury's actually in, and it says it's completely feasible and possible for us to um, um, run an electric fleet of vehicles, despite ESCOM's vagrancies, failures, and um, impacts. What we are going to need is a hell of a lot of social uh, solar generation, a ton of storage at ranks. We're going to need to strengthen the grid in certain places, um, definitely for, 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 for the grid to be utilized. But very excitedly, South Africa has a standard, or a researched you know, at the uh, Nelson Mandela Bay University for vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle charging. So you have the potential as a operator to charge the vehicle next to you. So in terms of the impact on load shedding, um, I think this can potentially accelerate our um, um, decentralized power distribution. Um, and, and there is a path of feasibility. How much range is needed? And this is the beauty of the minibus taxi. Thanks to the data we've collected over the last four, five, six years, we know how much range is needed. It's 120 to 160 kilometers per day per vehicle for most urban operations. You can then lower your costs means more money in the system, not going to operating costs. You need to coordinate much closer because these charging hubs will need to be managed. There's, there's a revenue opportunity for the industry there. There will be true incentives coming through from all sorts, in including industrial um, 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 incentives. And so it, it really has an opportunity to completely change the landscape and, and in, you know, for a change in South Africa, increase the pie thanks to um, um, economic growth. So who must do what? what? What do the role players do? So let the state do what the state does, build a whole bunch of stuff, regulate and importantly enforce. So if we think about a network of solar and storage PTIs, that's a huge build program right there. If we think about priority lanes for minibuses, that's going to really you know, be that incentive. I think it was mentioned earlier today. Adequate holding facilities, PPPs around TODs and facilities, and all of these electric minibuses have, will, will have incredible electronic systems. Let's take advantage of those. So let the state be the facilitator in that, in that axis, in that diagram. Let's place the minibus taxi industry at the center of urban mobility network improvements. Let's sit in the room as planners and listen to what the industry wants to do. Let us as local government set the rules of the game. 
Let's work with the associations to set up passenger charters. Let's use technology to bring passengers closer to transport, allow um, passenger experience to be improved and have rewards based subsidization that's technology driven. All of these things are feasible, possible. We have the skills and technology to do this. We just need to uh, sit uh, in the room and plan together. And me and Chris did not um, um, uh, conspire to use the same downtown hub in Kigali as an example of what a new system could look like. That is, again, another happy coincidence. And lastly, let's look at the industrial need for us to find and bring in an electric mini bus taxi, one that can compete at cost with ICE vehicles. And there are some models. That's a UK model. Um, there's a, you know, that's still a, a, a few years away, I suppose, Canoe. Um, there's some Turkish models we've shown you. So there are models out there. Let's, let's have an industrial policy that brings that together. And then, unfortunately, over the last year, I've had to knock on the doors of DOT, DTI, DST, SARS, Treasury, DMRE, DPE, DEA. I ran out of acronyms because of all the government departments you need to talk to about electric vehicles. There is a huge fragmentation when it comes to what we need to do, whether it's changing duties, VAT, um, whether it's discussing the, the TRP and how to incentivize e-mobility, e, e preferential rates for financing, public procurement policies on, 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 on uh, city fleets. Um, so, so just like we, I think, have identified the need for the super agency, and you'll recall about six months ago, maybe, or a year ago at the last transport forum, we had opportunity to speak, I spoke about there being like a sandal for public transport, a central super agency that can drive implementation um, and bring technocratic excellence. We need the same thing for an e-mobility strategy when you look, look at this fragmented space. So last minute, what are we doing? So what is Go Metro doing to bring the future to uh, South African cities. Well, as you know, we've collected data and built um, data sets on vehicle operations for the last four, five, six years. We've taken that data. Um, this is an example in Mitchell's plan. We've taken that data. We've created routes. We've created tracking and monitoring software that ensures compliance can be done. So what we sit with is the fact that the technology is here. We have a full suite of management tools for minibus taxi management and for um, implementing a lot of these operational uh, requirements that we've, we've mentioned today. But most excitedly, I'm very pleased in the last 20 seconds of my time to announce that in Q1 2022, GoMetro, as part of a consortium of corporates, will be bringing the first electric minibus to South Africa for on-road testing. Uh, the model will be arriving here, you know, um, container ships pending. And we'll be looking at testing solar storage requirements, looking at on-road performance. We won't be able to do passenger trips in the first um, few months as we as we um, um, work with the vehicle. But we will be bringing electric minibuses into South Africa and hopefully assembling and building and constructing them too here, because this really does represent a whole new paradigm in partnering. Government building facilities like that with much more solar capacity, charging being managed by the association, uh, owners getting um, much more data and information on operations, drivers uh, moving into a reform program, the incentive structures being able to be driven. All of this happens by allowing this wave of electromobility to um, overtake us. I hope you got you excited. And um, there's my details. Please reach out if you want to um, be part of the uh, future. Thanks, Harry. Thank you, Justin. Keep your details there for a moment. Um, uh, it's exciting technology, really. And thank you for this innovation. Uh, I hope this technology will also make the taxi stop at the red traffic light. Um, in the right in, yeah, the right incentives will. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thank you, Justin. Really appreciate it. Please be available for the questions and answers. Right, ladies and gents, we're catching up a little bit on time here. Our next... Uh, Panelist then is Walter Hook. Hopefully he's still with us. Uh, Walter, would you kindly be a respondent for us? Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Um, well, I, I really appreciate the, the speakers on this panel. I learned a lot from it. Um, there's, there's, a, there's a sort of a political moment in South Africa where uh, people are feeling very frustrated with the rollout of the system. You know, when the system was originally uh, conceived, it was always intended to be a one lever that the government had to transform the informal minibus taxi industry into formal companies that would then operate the system. 
it was never intended to be the only effort that the government took to formalize the minibus tax industry. Uh, it was simply one mechanism, and and it had its you know it had its up and down. Um, I think there is a because the system took so long to pull out. Uh, there is a growing frustration in the capacity of the state to intervene effectively in public transportation more generally. And that frustration has in some ways led, led certain members of the intellectual community to simply say, well, in the end, the minibus tax industry is doing all the heavy lifting for the public transit system. There's really nothing we can do about it. <clears throat> Let's just you know, and they don't get any subsidies and all the subsidies go to the formal sector, which moves very few people. Let's just give money directly to the, to the minibus taxi industry, because it is completely unreformed. And, you know, I think that that, that is a, a dangerous position to take, because as, as Justin quite rightly pointed out, I mean, giving money away to taxi uh Tax the uh, associations that are violently competing for territory would lead to some competitive consequences and certainly wouldn't lead to any improvement in the quality of service for passengers in South Africa. However, I think that everyone here is loud and clear the need to use the possibility of, of government subsidies to thought about uh, in a new way, uh, giving giving the subsidy money to the municipalities to experiment in ways in which it can bring more of the taxi industry into the formal public transit system. And I think that there needs to be flexibility, there needs to be experimentation in how that works. Obviously, one way is, is what Cape Town is considering, which is to uh, give a small subsidy to minibus taxi, bring passengers to the formal network. I think there's there's also uh, much to be said for tendering out uh, uh, other route-based uh, concessions to the taxi, uh, thinking about the, the non-BRT-related parts of the uh, I think it's reasonable to look into uh, less rigid formalization of the industry, lighter transition, more gradual transitions. Uh, but I, I do want to emphasize that in other countries where the governance of the, of the bus operators that were formed from the tax industry, where that governance improved, it was because of the competitiveness of the tendering. Now, if you don't have the pressure of comp competition, then the, the leverage that the government has to essentially force good corporate government on the industry is lost. And so out of the transmillennial process in Bogota, because of the competitive bidding process, companies that form had to conform to good corporate governance and good companies came out of that. And those companies now are operating systems all over Latin America. And because it was negotiated in South Africa, the corporate governance of these companies never really formed into sort of modern, it's like we would want. Uh, so uh, I think that, it, uh, that the political moment in South Africa is critical, uh, that the power of the state be used to uh, uh, the, use their tendering procedure to, uh, to say, sure, we'll give an operating contract for these non-PRT corridors to members of the tax industry that are able to corporatize, make it be a heavy-handed uh, requirement. But uh, but there needs to be the use of power of the state to leverage improved corporate governance within the tax industry, but also improve uh, public service delivery on the part of the tax industry. So I think we all agree we need uh, more efforts to involve the tax industry in the planning process, in the transformation process. But let's not lose sight of the fact that we do need to transform the industry into something more formalized that gives the passengers uh, a higher quality of service, safer trip, and uh, a, a better uh, network. I guess with that I'd like to open up. 
Thank you, thank you, Walter. Much appreciated. Um, let's uh, have the panelists, uh, Java, Darko, Justin, Chris, if you guys maybe can switch on your cameras. Let's see if we can bring you in. Robert as well. Could I just comment because, um, yeah, I, I was quite excited to hear about the initiative that Justin has, has come up with because I really do feel that South Africa needs some kind of um, a kickstart. And I mentioned the World Cup. But, you know, my, the last line on my presentation was climate action is the new driving force. And, of course, in formalizing the taxi industry is a difficult challenge. We talked about it today. They need some incentive. And this idea of subsidizing perhaps the conversion or the purchase of electric taxi vehicles and then utilizing the new technology maybe gives them something. I mean, we need some really big initiative that's driven by a bigger initiative. So carbon footprint and climate action is a huge initiative. It's getting bigger. It's going to hit us all. And you need something like that to really, really push the changes that are required. And the, as somebody mentioned, I mean, the expertise is in South Africa. I mean, the planning expertise is there and the bus operation expertise is there. We just need this big overriding initiative that the politicians can grasp, that then the government can finance, that then we can bring in a regime of implementation. And I think Justin came up with something. It's only one element. I mean, this is a much more multi-complex environment, but it's one real element that I think is worth holding on to. And I, I think it's something should be brought forward to talk about further. But, but, you know, climate is a driver, and we should really ride on that at the moment because governments will be pushed into spending money in the climate action area, and they will be subsidizing activities in that area, for better or for worse. And some of them will be money losers, and some will be money gainers. But if you want something that might attract the taxi industry, you know, the idea of getting a new taxi, electric vehicle, it's got the, the capacity to run the business in, in terms of uh, battery life and all that kind of thing. There's some supports in there for replacement of vehicles. You know, it's a chance to maybe get better, bigger vehicles, lots of things. And, and then the government has a role in providing the bigger infrastructure that needs to be provided. And look, at diesel cars are gone in 20 years' time. I mean, we might as well face some of these realities and start using it as a mechanism to move. And I just thought that was a timely intervention, Justin. I haven't talked to you before this, but genuinely, uh, we need some specific initiatives that genuinely can, I, I think, um, create a boost uh, in the industry and, and drive a change. That's it. Thank you, Rob. Um, ladies and gents, you're welcome to raise your hand if you want to ask a question. Is uh, you see at the bottom of your screen, there's a reactions option where you can use your raise hand function. Then I can recognize you. Um, but okay, so there's obviously lots of discussions going on in the chat room and it's, it's so many, it's quite difficult to try and, and, and address all of them. We will definitely send them on to Ibram and myself. We will work on it and, and get some answers and we'll send all of you some answers on the questions then unanswered. Um, all right, so we've got Ntombi Zondwa. You're welcome to sorry, unmute and uh, ask sorry, a Harry, question. Just, sorry, Harry, it's Brian. Just a little bit of housekeeping because I see Jared. I think I saw uh, Jared Walker's uh, camera on at some point. Uh, welcome, okay, Harry. let's bring him in. Uh, no, I think we, because this discussion would be very good and useful. I'm sure it'll carry on. So maybe we should just set a time limit and wrap up at, at some point so we kick back into Jared's session and then we can always, at the end, pick up how we take things forward. Do we need to circulate a document with a Q&A or some ideas, a bit of a debate online, future forum, etc. But I think, so mm -hmm. people could see the discussion now as like a sampler and obviously these sessions are, uh, are never long enough. And then we can maybe in 10, 10 minutes kick into the last session. I don't know if that's okay. Good everyone. Yes. Thanks. All right. Let's do it. Ten minutes. Thank you, Ibram. We will be sensitive for our time. Um, so we've got Ntombi Zotwa. You're welcome to ask a question. Hi. Hi, everybody. Um, I wonder if you can hear me. Yes. Um, I'm currently uh, management um, at Piotrans. 
um, recently uh, joined and come on board. And um, I think this is more directed to, to Walter in terms of uh, the need for the tendering process and the need for uh, corporate governance, um, something that I totally, totally agree with. Uh, but I think my, my main concern is the lack of support uh, that Justin and Javier talked about in terms of taking um, informal taxi operators, um, asking them to run a formal operation without the necessary support. And I, literally, I just found, I joined Piotrans, and that is a major, major problem to where we find ourselves. And it, it, I think it's very, given that the, the support was not given, and then now we are asking them to go into a tendering process where I think the tendering process is also unfair because no one has to tender for a new taxi permit. So now you're asking people to give away their taxi permits and then now after 12 years, you're asking them to, to re-tender. Um, yeah, I will just leave it at that. I'm not sure if there's a, something or if he has an answer for me. I understand the governance point of view, uh, but you are literally curtailing uh, the longevity of, of these permits if people go formal. Thank you. Thank you. Tom, is that well? Don't know if I want to, Darko, don't know if you guys want to respond to that. Um, look, uh, I don't think in, in Tom, he um, probably has understood from the beginning the concept of this transformation. Um, even, even as we speak, the taxi industry, yes, there is no tender, but there is application process for the operating licenses, which is not supposed to be approved automatically. It has to go through a cycle and through the process of being approved by a pending authority. But obviously, that's not observed. So, in the past, whatever, 20 years since the operating licenses have been introduced, there hasn't been any a rejection of application for operating licensing as long as the tax association approves it, which is not also uh, part of the legal process, it's more convenience process that is being followed. But I think when we do talk about transformation, there are many aspects of it that need to be taken into account. And obviously perceptions, expectations, and taking things for granted is one of the things, you know, which, which is not easy to deal with uh, in a short space of time. So, how to actually bridge that and uh, obviously now we are facing the first um, uh, cycle uh, completion the first cycle of the first uh, prp company in a 12 year cycle and and surely the, the, the tender approach is, is is not an easy to comprehend by the by the stakeholders for the involved but as i said it's a much broader uh, matter i would also like to mention we can talk about, I mean, we all talk, and I mean, there's no political forum, there's no political level that acknowledges the value of the taxi industry. And we all agree that they have brought extreme value to the society. However, in, in our public transport subsidy policy, but at the, at the same time, taxi industry and taxi operators has been crying for the subsidies, okay? Now, when you look at the purely transport economic perspective, and that's not the rocket science, the minibus taxi, minibus taxi vehicle mode, I'm not talking about industry, but as a vehicle, would not fit almost in any of the urban corridors and urban routes where the, the, where the certain densities and certain demand is there, you know. So it's on a very few corridors and routes, and maybe, maybe in the rural areas or maybe smaller towns where the taxi, industry, taxi vehicles would fit in. So what we are proposing in the policies, disassociate, divorce yourself from the vehicle mode uh, put yourself in a business mode doesn't matter what vehicle you have to run you please accept go for the tender go for whatever uh, networking business uh, development uh, approach that you can um, you can you, you can you have on your on your on your on your plate and basically go for it and another extremely important aspect is that the key for the 
for the planning for the transport system is a transportation plan. And it's actually legislative requirement. Every local government has to have integrated transport plan. So it's actually integrated transport plans who, that will have to come up with a, with a, a, a transport systems options, being the electric vehicles, being the natural gas, being whatever, from the from taking into consideration all the planning parameters that need to be taken into account. So yes, we have all these nice ideas, but somehow it doesn't fit into the at least the theoretical and the legislative cycle that we, we have approved ourselves. Let me call them. Yeah. Thank you, Doc. That's an important answer on an important question. Walter, you want to say something? Yeah. Um, you know, in, in every country, the, the, the companies that uh, got government contracts want to keep them into perpetuity. And it's a natural. Any, any government that has a monopoly would like to retain the monopoly. But, uh, you know, the competitive process would force the company... Piotrans has money, you know, it's had a nice contract for a long time. It can hire experts. And in fact, it did in its early years have a partnership with Penalta, which was a Colombian manufacturer and uh, a, a operator, one of the most successful. The Penalca has operations all over the world. And uh, the Piotrans board threw them out, you know. Now they retained a couple of the staff members, and that's how they went on. Forced by competition, they can hire expertise. That's what every other operator in the world does when they're forced by competition. You know, they're they're not. Uh, you can't constantly be looking to the government for another handout. You, you, you know, the whole point is the biotrans were to hire uh, partners to help them or experts to help them. They could also be very competitive on the next corridor, when the next quarter goes up for competition. And you could build into a modern company instead of saying, well, we need more time to, to improve our operations. How much time do you need? I mean, this is not our problem. If, if the government just needs the quality of service. So I, I really am afraid that if we let go of the opportunity for competitive tendering, we're just going to uh, give the industry an excuse not to step up to the plate and make the, the corporate reforms that it needs to make. Uh, Walter, just Ibrahim, just, just to push that thought, uh, sorry, Harry, uh, I, I, think, I think that's accepted. And, uh, and I think you're making it quite clearly and strongly. So I think that's, we, you know, you're holding us to the, you know, to the straight and narrow. I, I think just reflect on the flip side, because I think that's what we're feeling, like, say, pragmatically from the operators that they didn't get enough support or this or that, or maybe it's new management now. Uh, how would you reflect going forward? Like, uh, is there a business development type of support in that first round of contracting that's required? Or like, how, like, like going forward when other, other cities set up first round negotiated contracts, if they do? Uh, any advice like to prevent someone after 12 years saying we we're not ready yet because you didn't give us enough support i i mean you know uh, there was a lot of support given to the industry to make that transformation and if anybody should know it should be darko because he was the guy working with his company and others to to actually help build piotrans and and they did a great job and so I think it was right that certainly the process is helped a lot by government technical support to the industry to form those companies. And I think that that, that was a, the right choice. And I think it's reasonable in the first round uh, to, to provide support for that. I also think it's a good idea to, to have other initiatives going on around the city to formalize the industry uh, that that maybe are not quite as uh, ambitious as as it requires to run a BRT operation. You could start uh, consolidating the industry in in the non-trunk corridors and in, in through other government tendering mechanisms uh, that would prepare the industry. But you know, at the end of the day, uh, a monopoly does not. Uh, voluntarily uh, improve itself because it doesn't have to. And so, you know, after 12 years, at, at, you know, it's true that the government didn't continually hold the hand of the operator, but at a certain point, it's really not their business. They're a private company. They need to step up to the plate. And it's been clear for 
because it's written in the NLTA that, that the contract will be tendered next time and they've had plenty of time to prepare for this. So, you know, I, I, to some extent, I'm, I'm certainly sympathetic with the parts of the industry that are just now having to, to farm, but, and they need some help. But, but, but the guys that have already been assisted, at this point, there needs to be state pressure for them to step up and, and, and put together a, a, a viable proposal for, for continuing as one of the operators through a competitive process. Thank you, Walter. I appreciate it. Um, ladies and gents, we're running badly out of time. So let's uh, proceed to the next uh, section of our event. But before we do that, I just want to hear quickly from Justin, uh, our panelists, Justin and Darko and Chris and some of you guys got some quick closing remarks for this stage, Justin. Yeah, if I could, um, I think, yeah, so, so, so I think um, my presentation is more uh, given, like, let's just get on and do something, you know, um, in the absence of state vision, political will, and this driving force, how do we create some momentum, and introducing a low cost electric minibus to change the economics, change the relationships, to me is a, is a very exciting thing to just get, get, get done and doing, because we almost, you know, don't need much state involvement to to get moving. Um, however, you know, we does not um, detract from the need for a, a transport hierarchy for quality bus services for mass transit moving, um, and and certainly uh, the the role of el electrical transformation or electromobility tra transformation here is to catalyze system change to catalyze how we think about our hubs, how we think about the, the relationship in the, in the network. So um, if, yeah, please, um, I suppose as a caveat, don't think I'll, th I think that um, putting a spark in everything changes everything, but I do think it allows us to start a spark that, that starts uh, maybe us moving in the right direction. Um, and as a, a old professor of mine said, there's no silver bullets in, you know, in transport, there's only a whole bunch of lead. Uh, bullets, um, particularly in the taxi industry. So um, yeah, we uh, we just have to uh, move forward and change. Thank you, Justin. Must appreciate it. Darky, you want to say closing remarks? Uh, I spoke a lot, I think, but uh, I, I look, uh, surely this whole transformation is a long-term process and any initiative uh, could assist possibly, and, and through these initiatives, maybe some new ideas can be can be explored. Maybe just as an interesting uh, point, uh, CNG um, technology has been offered to the industry in build up to the real wire phase 1A. Uh, and there was actually CNG station that is being built in Landlachte in Johannesburg. And uh, associations that has been approached, uh, only few uh, um, driver operators, or driver owners, have uh, uh, accepted the conversion because uh, taking the um, taking the, the the cash out of the driver was not acceptable. <laughs> so I don't know. I mean, in the business model that they operate right now, they obviously many of these sort of uh, maybe uh, uh, challenges and maybe smaller challenges that we maybe don't see. But uh, uh, certainly, certainly, if the business model can fit into the that kind of a stakeholders environment or micro stakeholder environment, why not, you know? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Appreciate it. <clears throat> Javier, you've got uh, planning comments? Uh, look, it's, it's just to mention that remember, upskilling and capacitation works both ways. It's not only for the taxi industry, it's also for the municipalities to upskill their, their officials, okay? Uh, if the VUC is expecting for the municipality or the city to assist them, but if they don't have the capacity to do it and they only rely on a PMU, then, then that's basically a vicious circle that actually needs to be somehow break. So upskilling is for both government, the VUCs, and less dependencies on PMUs. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much, Jada. Uh, let's do Chris. Okay, sure. Um, yeah, I, I agree with a lot of the points that have been raised, like especially the need to move toward competitive bidding to get the prices down. And it's it's really important that uh, government lay the groundwork for doing that. So for instance, as you know, as we're moving forward in the minibus transformation, you know, one of the critical things to enable a competitive environment is to have the government-owned depot space. 
Um, and so that's something that's there in the BRT systems. And, you know, so it actually, the, you know, the cities are in a really good place to be able to do a competitive contract for the BRTs. And that's something that we didn't have in Kigali because the depots are, are still uh, controlled by the operators. Um, but I think it's really critical moving forward to leverage, you know, whatever operating subsidies are introduced to, to really change and improve the business model and to achieve the improvements in service quality um, in the process. And, and so not, you know, let, let's not miss that opportunity if, if we're going to extend um, the, the subsidies to the, the minibus industry. And then I think at, at the larger level, we, we really need to question the, the overinvestment in, the, in road building and, and highway expansions. Um, because when we say that there's no money available for public transport subsidies and, you know, and solving these problems, there really is. And it's just that we're spending it on, you know, on projects that are mainly catering toward the, the upper income groups that are using private cars. So I think we have to also look at that macro issue so that we can free up more funding um, to, to support this move that we want to see, you know, to a really high quality public transport system. So let me leave it there, but thanks for the good discussion. Thank you, Chris. Before I get, uh, give our respondent the last word here, um, Jared, you want to say something now? You're next up. You want to say something now on this stage? I don't, uh, I'm sorry, I'm, st I'm standing by ready for my presentation whenever you're, whenever you get to it. Thank you. Thank you, Jared. Thank you. Walter, last words, sir. Uh, you know, I think I've said enough, um, but I, uh, I really appreciated all the uh, inputs from the speaker, many of which I agree with. So uh, let's, let's give the floor to Jared. Great stuff. Thank you very much, panel. Let's give him a break, a big hand. Really appreciate it. So ladies and gents, our next presenter then is Jared Walker. He's the president and principal consultant, Jared Walker and Associates. Uh, and you can see his credentials there. He's going to give us the introduction to international bus network redesign experiences. Thank you very much, Jared. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and to talk with you today. Um, my presentation should be up on the screen. Please let me know if it's not. Um, okay, I was um, uh, really appreciate the opportunity to talk with you about bus network design and redesign. I think we're talking about something that is just beginning to be developed in your country, um, and but it's something that has enormous potential. It does require you to think about some of what you do a little bit differently. Um, just a moment. Um, who are we? We are a firm that really does net bus network design and redesign all over the world. We're fairly dominant in the United States. We've done more of them than anyone else, but we're also working around the world on similar kinds of projects, Australia, New Zealand, Iceland, Ireland, Russia. And um, um, our role is really not just to draw some lines on a map, but to help a community, a country, a government think through what its goals actually are, what it's ultimately trying to achieve and how it's going to measure those goals so that we can design a network that delivers on your goals rather than the goals that some, some consultant comes along and thinks you should be planning for. But that requires us to think a lot about goals and about all the different things that people bring to this question. And what we've started to notice is that a great many of the goals that people have, and I'm talking, by the way, about the collective goals for public transport, which is, of course, very different from goals an operating company may have or goals you may have in a business mode as you're trying to manage your operating, your operating company. I'm talking about the ultimate goal. I'm talking about the reason a citizen should care. I'm talking about the reason that, that, that everyone should care. It really comes down to the fact that it takes too long and costs too much for people to reach the opportunities that they need to have a good life. And so what I want to ask, does that matter? Is that a, a thing you care about in your society? Because if so, we can measure it. And if we can measure it, we can talk about fixing it. So let me draw you a picture of access to opportunity in the way we talk about it now. <clears throat> so here's a person. 
She's in a city that's full of possible destinations, places she could work, places she could shop, places she could study, places she could worship, and so on, people she could meet. Now, in an amount of time that she is likely to have in her day, um, she can get to a certain area on public transport. And her access to opportunity is simply the amount of her city that is in that area, the amount of the destinations and opportunities she could achieve. I will sometimes describe this blob as the wall around your life, because if something is outside of the wall, it's simply not available to you. It might as well not exist. And so when we move this wall outward, we're simply improving everyone's life and improving everyone's freedom by virtue of their ability to get to more places. We're also, of course, improving their ability to improve their own lives. So let's look at some pictures of this. When we did the big redesign of Dublin in Ireland, we were able to draw pictures like this for any location. So if this hypothetical person named Jane happens to live near Dublin City University, there's an area she could get to in the old network, and then there's an area she can get to in the planned network. And so there's a difference between those two areas where the red means what she's lost and the blue means what she's gained. And I can turn that into a number. I can say that Jane can reach 43% more jobs or uh, school enrollments in, in, um, in this case, 45 minutes. So I've dramatically improved the possibilities of Jane's life by virtue of making it possible for her to do so many things, access so many other kinds of opportunity. Then of course, I can just aggregate this citywide. So I look citywide and each of these cells is, is colored in according to how many more jobs or opportunities you can get to from there. And then I can produce a citywide statistic like the average Dubliner could reach 20% more jobs in 30 minutes. And by the way, I can of course slice that by any other population. I can talk about the average experience for low income people, people of, of a particular race or, or ethnic group or whatever else you want to study. Um, but this helps us really describe sort of where the benefits are and people can look at this immediately and say, okay, those benefits are pretty well distributed. And where we have brown here, where access has been reduced, um, these are mostly places where there aren't very many people. So here's the thing, when we focus on access and when we measure the access results of our work, we are talking about so many different things that different people care about. So when we're talking about reducing poverty, reducing disadvantage, isolation, or injustice to various subgroups within the population, well, that's exactly what we're measuring because access is opportunity. And if we're going to talk about how we distribute a resource fairly among different areas or parts of the population, this is the thing that we should talk about distributing equitably, as opposed to, for example, giving everyone one thing, giving everyone one piece of rail or piece of BRT, because what really matters is not what, to, what infrastructure you have next to you. What matters is where you can actually go on that infrastructure. And it's certainly possible to build infrastructure that doesn't actually improve your ability to go anywhere. It's a result of the entire network that you're able to go more places. Um, at, when we're talking about economic goals, access to opportunity drives economic activity. Uh, as any economist will tell you, the whole purpose of a city is to, is to allow people to live close to lo lots of opportunities. Access to opportunity is why cities exist in the first place. And that's exactly what we're measuring when we measure access to opportunity in this way. Finally, access is the most durable source of ridership. It correlates very strongly with ridership. And if you think about it for a minute, it's obvious why. Because if you have access to a greater area with more opportunities, you've also increased the odds that any particular person, when they look up a trip they want to make, will find that the travel time is reasonable. And that is the key to making it, uh, making it logical for people to use public transport. Um, and finally, of course, access encourages good or informed public high access public transport is an excellent reason to build more things at the place where that benefit exists, um, tends to support um, densification in patterns around public transport. You get um, sustainability benefits around pollution, climate, energy efficiency, and so on out of planning for access. So that's the remarkable thing. It does so many different things that are important to so many different people and reveals that inside all of those different goals, there's a single thing that we can measure. 
So what are the barriers to access? Why can't people get to where they need? Well, I should have mentioned, of course, the land use pattern, but that's kind of out of our hands at the moment. So just turning down, turning to the level of transport planning. The three barriers are the inefficient use of road space, the inefficient use of labor, and the lack of coordination in fares and service design just across public transport. Now, you've all seen this picture. Ultimately, in a dense city, what is a city? A city is lots of people living close together, which means that a city is a shortage of space per person, which means that the success of a city is about using space fairly, uh, fairly and efficiently. And so this famous image about how much uh, space 100 people take, depending on whether they're on bicycles or in cars or in a bus, captures that fundamental reality that ca cars use space inefficiently, which means that they require us to travel in a way that causes us to get in each other's way, which in turn means we are, by doing what we need to do, obstructing the access to opportunity for other people. And we are not doing that when we're on bicycles or on public transport. Now, this is a time, of course, where we have enormous amounts of technology marketing all around us. And this marketing, uh, many of these tools are excellent, but they tend to be over-promoted. And so whenever someone wants to talk about how will all these great inventions fit together to, to create our new world, I want to say, no, 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 let's talk about how they're separate so that we don't buy the solution to one problem thinking it will solve a different problem. So we have a problem of communications in our transport network, the problem of simply having information when and where it's needed. And that's been an area of enormous uh, um, development and improvement. And, and these, these kinds of apps, real-time information and so on, dispatch information, as we've heard about before, are becoming standard. We have a separate and unrelated question about emissions and the efficient use of energy, which is pushing us toward electric vehicles. We have a separate and unrelated question about safety, and which is helping the push toward vehicle automation, not necessarily totally driverless cars, but certainly vehicles that help the driver avoid accident. And finally, unrelated to all of those, we have the issue of the efficient use of space in dense cities. And the only solution to that is going to be vehicles large enough to, to carry large numbers of people in very little space. So there is no tech alternative to that because this is a geometric fact and technology never changes geometry. Now, when we talk about the inefficient use of space and or labor, the bottom line is if we carry more passengers per driver, we can afford more service and therefore produce more access. That's labor efficiency. But also where space is scarce, we are we, and we use too small a vehicle, we are reducing access as in the image on the right. We're using a vehicle that's too small. Those vehicles are taking too much space and therefore they are in each other's way in a way that is reducing where people can get to. So what about minibuses? Well, they have a very big role, but that role in the long run is not this, right? When we use minibuses in an environment where space is extremely scarce, they simply are not enough of an improvement over cars in terms of the efficient use of space to avoid continuing to create congestion, which prevents people from being able to go where they need to do to access opportunity. But of course they have an enormous role when and where there is enough space, they, they, have a, they have an enormous role in transport and they will continue to have an enormous role in transport, often for reaching beyond the range of where larger buses make sense to bring in um, larger numbers of people. And of course, in your country, one of the things we, uh, one of the things that's obvious is that many of your lowest income people, your people who have the greatest need for transport are living in fairly remote places on the edges of the metropolitan area and therefore need a great deal of access. Many buses will continue to have a role in helping those people get to the local centers where it makes sense for fixed bus service to, to take them from there. So coordination arises from the fact that we get more access for everyone. More people can get to more places so that they can do more things in their lives if, first of all, all of the subsidized services work together, and I mean subsidized very broadly, I really should include regulated services in that, 
But also in a good partnership, each kind of public transit should do what it is good at. And each kind of public transit is good at a different thing. So if you think about these axes of distance, trip distance on the Y and density on the X, um, we have a situation sort of like this. First of all, there's a very, very low trip distance at which walking will continue to be the ideal mode, regardless of density. Then way up when we're talking about connecting points of high density, but also over relatively large distances, that is the space for your rail services and for BRT. Um, that those tend to be ways of carrying people at very high capacity that use space very efficiently, which is why they tend to be used in places where you really need that efficiency at high density. They also tend to pay off better when you're traveling over longer distances because the speed and reliability improvements that are provided there um, add up over a longer distance in a way that's more significant to determining where people can get to. Now, the, mini, the logical minibus space is about this, but currently it's much larger. Currently, minibuses are trying to do many more things than this. But when you think about what a minibus is good at, when you're at low density, other kinds of fixed buses, there's simply not enough demand for them. And the minibus is an ideal tool uh, for that scale of demand at almost any distance. But as density goes up, minibuses increasingly hit their limits so that they increasingly are creating their own congestion. And that's why you need, you need to fill this missing gap here in this statement. And this missing gap is the local fixed route urban bus, not BRT, but also not a minibus, a network of conventional 12 to 16 meter um, fixed route buses operating at a high quality drops right into this gap. So, Higher density, but medium distance, also medium density and higher distance, both of those things are very suited to what fixed route buses do well. But the essence of all of these, of course, is these services have to connect with each other. You have to be able to get on from one and on to another, but well, that's the logical way to complete your trip. Connections, just remember the three Fs, please. Frequency, facilities, and fares. So frequency or time connections, the way you make it fast to get off one vehicle around another, that's a matter of network design. Um, facilities to welcome the traveler um, so that people feel that the, when they have to get off a vehicle at a certain point and get onto another vehicle, that they're in a civilized place that welcomes them. And fares, um, the need for distance-based fares where you're not paying multiple fares in the course of a trip, since that becomes another obstacle. Uh, and let me be honest, Many, many transit agencies in wealthy countries, certainly the United States, are still struggling with this one. This one is very difficult, but it's so important that, it, that we are struggling with it in practically every metro area because we can measure the harm that it does of, of requiring people to pay multiple fares. Um, good services are many things at once, and this is important. It's very tempting. I hear this all the time to say, well, this service is for these people and this service is for these people. And you've got to keep saying that no, high ridership is diverse ridership. Um, the more you get the highest ridership by making a service simultaneously useful to lots of different people going different directions. Um, many people going many directions for many purposes using the same vehicle, that is how we get lots of people to benefit from any particular service we provide. So I want to caution you to be a little careful about words like feeder, which tend to imply that a route has only one purpose. Uh, you have in Joburg, for example, some services that were designed specifically to feed bus rapid transit. But by the time you've gone any distance in a local service pattern, you've done a whole bunch of other things as well. You're also providing local service. And in many cases, a feeder from a citywide point of view may be the trunk from the point of view of a particular local area. So um, I certainly don't, don't oppose using, I certainly don't want to abolish the word. I just want to caution us to be careful not to ever describe a service as if, as if it has only one purpose or serves only one type of person. Now, one of the most powerful things that network redesign can do is to start to unlock the power of the frequent grid. What you have right now in, uh, in both Joburg, and especially in Cape Town, is a network that is pouring almost all the service into just a few nodes, very few. And that, of course, creates enormously busy hubs, but it also 
often takes people well out of direction. And the other thing it can do is create a lot of, of public transport congestion, especially minibus congestion, in densest parts of your cities. Now, the principle of the frequent grid is the opposite. And I'm not saying that the, trans, that the public transport network shouldn't continue to converge on centers, it should. But in a more mature network, what's converging on the centers is bigger vehicles carrying people into that center in a way that uses the center's limited space more efficiently. And one of the ways you do that is to make some trips possible without going to the center. So the opposite extreme is the frequent grid. So imagine we have a grid of services running at very high frequency in an approximate grid pattern. So no center, everywhere to everywhere is the idea. And the beautiful thing about this structure is that I don't have to pick favorites. From absolutely any point A, I can just close my eyes and point at the map anywhere, to absolutely any point B, the way you make this trip is the same. You walk, you ride, you get to a con you don't wait very long because the connection is because the service is frequent. You make a connection, you don't wait very long because the service is frequent, you ride, you walk. Those are the directions from anywhere to anywhere. Very powerful idea, we use it a lot in the United States and Europe. So the grid is a step beyond thinking of just in terms of the trunk feeder hierarchy, because now everything is a trunk and everything is a feeder to everything else. So you have more connection points, everywhere to everywhere access, and all the lines serving a diversity of trips. Now, of course, this is still a, a more micro level below this where, where minibuses are feeding this network at various points. But the structure of the fixed route network is this sort of everywhere to everywhere. This is how Los Angeles works. This is how Chicago works. This is how, um, this is to a great extent how London works. It's how a lot of big cities work. Now, your first reaction, and I know what your cities look like, is going to be, but my city isn't a grid. That's easy to say in Los Angeles or Chicago where the street network actually looks like this. To which I would say neither is Dublin. So when we redesigned Dublin, Ireland, um, what we were faced with was this enormously ob um, obstructed street network, not a grid at all. You see certain elements of a polar grid that, or, or spider web grid, that is to say there's a tendency for streets to all radiate out of the city center. And that tends to lead us to patterns of radial lines like these intersecting with orbital lines, circular lines like that, just like in a spider web. Um, but you'll see us down here trying to draw a straight line going across here through all these obstacles and all these twists and turns we have to just keep going straight. But we do that with a high frequency line. Why? Because the grid idea is so powerful. Because we find that when we keep doing that and try to get the grid in there, even when the street network is fighting with us, that is how we get very, very high levels of access to opportunity across the city. Now, one of the fundamental problems you have is just the question about whether government should be doing planning at all. You have a legacy of private planning, this, um, and it's interesting to see what happens when you do that. This is Nairobi. This is a map that an advocacy organization did of the existing Mutatu network, uh, which is essentially a minibus network. And what they, what they show is that basically absolutely everything is going to the city center. So what you have is an oversupply of service to one point, co corresponding with a complete inability to go anywhere else, right? You can't go from the northwest part of the city to the southwest part of the city on this network without going all the way into the center and back out. Many of your um, public transport networks here have elements of this. Um, and it tends to be what happens when individual operators are planning individual routes, but not planning the entire network because they don't have the control of the entire network. And this always happens when individual operators are essentially planning their own services. You get this massive overcrowding of services in the center and, and no service to do important kinds of orbital movements, like say from here down to here. Um, so let me take you through one quick case study to wrap up. Um, I worked about 10 years ago on a complete redesign for Auckland and New Zealand. Um, Australia and New Zealand at that point, when I first got there and I lived there for five years, 06 to 11, had largely surrendered to the private planning of public transport. So here too, the operating companies had drawn all the routes themselves. Almost all the routes went to the city center because that's where each operating company felt to be the, more, the profitable thing to do. That made sense for each operator. It just didn't make any sense for the city. It just didn't work for the city. Um, as a result, the city center was congested with partly empty buses because too many buses were going into the city center 
without having actually organized them, their loads in such a way that they would be using the space efficiently. And just as in Nairobi, it was hard to travel anywhere else in the region. Let me just give you a close up of this. This is the Mangare district on the south side of Auckland. And what you saw in the network before is just an absolutely incomprehensible pile of three digit route numbers, where it looks to me, it looks like the importance of a particular street is about the number of route numbers on it. Whereas, of course, route numbers are not a measure of the quality or quantity of service, they're a measure of the complexity of the service. And the complexity of this was simply overwhelming. Nobody could navigate it. All anyone did on this network was to make a trip that they made every day exactly the way they always made it because there was no other, there was no way to figure out how to do anything else. In the after network, we stripped all of this out. We created a network of frequent lines, which are the wider lines that you see here. And you'll notice they're trying to intersect as much as they can with each other and also with the rail network at the stations. And um, as a result of this frequency, it is actually faster to get, say, from a point on the pink line to a point on the orange line because the service is so frequent and it doesn't take long to connect. Whereas over here, you had a direct bus doing that, but because it was overlapping so many other direct buses, a bus might make that particular movement only once an hour, which is why it was actually faster to ask a few more people to connect. And you also see a much more orderly hierarchy here of frequent services, feeding rail, secondary services, connecting into the frequent services, and so on. So you get more connections. You get a clearer distinction of role between small vehicles and large vehicles, because we don't need large vehicles on these little squiggler routes that are just covering small areas into the centers. So we get much more efficient use of fleet and much more efficient use of space and a measurable expansion in access to opportunity, a measurable expansion in where people can get to which means a, an expansion in what people can do in their lives. Just to look at this at the citywide scale, the old network, this is this, and be, these are the colors we always use in all of our maps. Red meaning service every 15 minutes or better, blue meaning every 30, green meaning every 60. Now what you saw was just a tiny network that was frequent. But in the new network, what you see is an enormous uh, network of frequent services. Now the interesting thing about this, before, after, before, after, before, after. That huge expansion of frequency came without adding a single operating dollar. It was entirely the result of reorganizing all of those inefficient overlapping services into simpler packets. And that's how they got this enormous expansion of frequency. And now again, you can see the grid principle at work here and there, even where you don't have a grid pattern of streets, you just try to make sure that 15 minute lines or high frequency lines intersect in a logical way in as many places as possible. So to sum up, we need to plan for access to opportunity. And it's important to plan for that and not just for predictions of ridership. Because access to opportunity is actually a simpler thing to measure. And it is actually the thing that more people care about. Um, we need to use each tool where it works best. And ultimately, government must design that mostly missing fixed route bus network not just as a feature of BRT, but as its own complete layer serving many kinds of trips that really fills that gap we identified, the large space between BRT and minibus. But finally, the private sector will never do this themselves. Um, they cannot focus on the entire network or have the right uh, incentives to do this themselves. This really does have to arise out of government initiative. So with that, thank you very much. Here are my contact details and be happy to be around for further discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Jared. Please keep your information there for a few seconds. Uh, thank you very much for this interesting information. This curve concept really very, let's say, oh, I would say a breather. <laughs> um, thank you very much for this. I remember many years ago, we did uh, a planning session at DBSA and uh, uh, Bob Stanway, I think Bob, it was you, who, came into that meeting and threw a curveball right into that meeting by saying, okay, who's going to own the float? And uh, that was quite a, a winner of a question. <laughs> I wonder if we really have an answer to that one yet in terms of public transport. But uh, thank you very much, uh, Jared. Right, ladies and gents, we're going to ask Walter Hook to give us some comments. 
and then we'll have uh, a questions and answer session. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks a lot. Yeah, I, I really appreciate uh, Jared coming on today and, and sharing with us. He, he really has sort of transformed the thinking in the United States and, and many other parts of the world as well by, by really teaching us that we need to look at the bus network as a whole and then sort of prioritize our infrastructure investments around what makes sense at the network level. Uh, we certainly weren't doing that back in 2010, but I think now in South Africa, we have a kind of a historic opportunity where, where several things are, are changing at once. Um, clearly, there's a need to pay attention to what's happening in the non-BRT corridors. Uh, of course, the geometry problem's not gonna go away, so we should at least finish the, the dedicated bus infrastructure connecting our very high volume trips from town, former townships into the city centers and, and think about how uh, the, the network that serve those trunk lines uh, can be better turned into something like the sort of uh, grid of services that, that Jared presented. I think there's a, a growing recognition that we need to in, involve more of the minibus taxi industry in, in the formal or formalizing parts of the transit network. So I think that, that it might be a strategic opportunity uh, to, to, for the South African municipalities to, to take a look at the, that the transit service grid as a whole, looking at the minibus taxi industry network as it stands. And I think it does look a lot like what uh, Nairobi showed with sort of, sort of territories that don't in any way form an optimal network. Uh, think about how to incorporate uh, route changes into new business models that would involve the taxi industry, but in a reform business structure, uh, and then use that partially to, to make better use of the BRT infrastructure that's already been built and is underutilized. Uh, and even uh, as part of that process, take a look at, at how the, the services on the, the BRT infrastructure that we have uh, fits into that broader picture. Maybe there needs to be some changes made. So, uh, you know, I, I really appreciate Jared coming on. I, I, the impact that he's had, at least in, in our countries, in the United States and in Europe uh, has been huge. Uh, the, the tantalizing possibility that we could uh, spend no more money on our transit services, but get, you know, 20% more ridership just by network optimization is, is amazing. And, and sometimes that's being realized. Uh, you know, Houston's been a big success. I think uh, Auckland was a big success. Um, uh, you know, although as with BRT, if you don't have the expertise that you need, you could, you could make a mess. So, you know, network optimization like BRT does require getting the best minds in the room and, and, uh, and, and making something that will really work for everybody. And of course, the piece of that puzzle is obviously involving the industry that is providing those services in the process. I thought that point was made earlier. It's an excellent point. Uh, and with that, I think I will uh, uh, open the floor to questions. Thanks very much. Thank you, Walter, uh, for the comments. Ladies and gents, you can use the reactions at the bottom of your screen, raise your hand so they can recognize you should you have any questions? It can be for anybody, any of the panelists today. Rob, do you have a comment? Um, well, I, I would just, of course, endorse what Walter is saying. I mean, Jarrett has had significant um, input into our bus operations in Dublin. We, we queried and thought about what we would do in Dublin for many, many years with our bus, uh, our bus operations. You know, but something comes across to me that, you know, we really have to move beyond our, our, our transport planning thinking for South Africa, uh, our transport planning thinking in, in Europe and in, in the US, um, and try and mold it into the South African environment and how that thinking can be best brought to South Africa. Because there are very fundamental differences to where, where South Africa is at right now today and where it needs to be, and um, how best to get there, and how best to bring South Africa, you know, along with us uh, in our European thinking, our American thinking, it might not be really what's imperative for South Africa right now. 
Um, operational change is urgently needed in South Africa. The, the, the changes around transport planning thinking, of course, they need to be done in parallel, but there are some very fundamental operational on the ground issues in South Africa that I think we understand them, but we need to articulate them and we need to really uh, get, get, get to grips with them. So sitting down you know, with the industry, the minibus taxi industry, in the knowledge that yes, they cannot plan a city network. They cannot improve the city network because they only see their own association and their own association's routes that they operate. They need to be guided in that. I hear we need business acumen, business expertise within the industry to help them transform and understand um, how they're going to form proper PTYs and how they're going to operate within a, a, a semi-regulated, but then just as just as Justin mentioned, a potentially deregulated informal environment. Like we don't have that type of informal environment in Ireland. Um, we don't have it particularly in the United States, uh, but we do see it in Dar es Salaam, we do see it in Nairobi, um, we do see it all over Africa. Um, and in some places, maybe South Africa can be out, can actually show us how that informal taxi operation can be really harnessed um, in line with a, a government controlled initiative. I think the action has to be at, 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 at a taxi level and at operation level for the next five years um, to get the systems to a point where we can really uh, bring in those, those, those higher level transportation planning. You know, we try to bring them in. In 2010, we've tried to bring in all the right uh, initiatives uh, within the BRT plans. And, you know, I mean, we understand why it didn't work. But tweaking around at the edges, there's fundamental change required in South Africa in terms of public transport. And that's why I liked a simple initiative like Justin, something that we can, we can just harness, you know, um, that we can work on. Um, and climate change is one of those things. And I, I think Chris Koss mentioned something too. How we spend our money in South Africa on our highway network. You know, we have the best, you guys have the best highway network that I've seen all around the world. You have a fantastic highway network. But do we need to keep putting all of the money that you've got into that highway network? And could we start thinking about reallocating some of that resource into the public transport uh, uh, network? And that's it. Look, I, I, I don't to talk it to, to death, but we've heard great stuff from Jared. And I, and I do believe that the, the, the four big cities in, in SA could, could, could benefit just from um, a better operational uh, network uh, put on paper and, and use that then to try and help the minibus taxi industry to improve their own uh, traditional, I call them traditional route networks. Thanks. Thank you, Rob. Much appreciated. Let's uh, have Justin, and then after Justin, we'll have Bob. Bob Stanley. Thank you, Justin. Thank you. Um, yeah, so, so thank you, Jared. It was a um, fantastic um, presentation. Um, really, really useful. And yeah, I think from um, our, our traditional perspective in South Africa, from the, you know, the, the handbook written in 1985, which we've maybe not edited ever again, um, we, we have a, a way of defining our network from a supply side. So everyone can do a current public transport record list which is a list of all the routes and um, an assessment of what routes exist, what services exist. But the evaluation of those services from the perspective of the user, just like you did Jane with you know, what her opportunities are that she has, it represents itself as a way to engage with the public and with politicians to articulate the value or the reason the um, current planning in South Africa, which is very supply side oriented and supply side managed um, 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 planning regime, it, it, it is a problem. You know, the, the, the way we write ITDPs and have CPTRs in our planning regime is a problem that um, distances the results um, and dehumanizes those results into something that feels very, very far away. And I think with regards to, um, you know, Rob made a very, very interesting comment right now, um, which was that you, you know we 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 almost started with in 2010 with this like trying to set up the institutions to make the change happen and at a net make the change happen and at a network level and for the next five or ten years let's just focus on wheels turning and partnerships and through wheels turning if we if we can have a metric of improving jane's accessibility having wheels turn 
and having partnerships, whatever form they take, however they work, whatever it is, I think we can we can actually get some momentum moving versus this state interventionist, centralized, central controlled. The paradox, though, is that this needs to be driven by, in my mind, a super agency. You know, the, the reason why we've got these great highways is because we've got Sanrel. There needs to be a super agency. And I think NDOT has done a great job in, in, in just catalyzing this industry. I think we'd have a lot less public transport planning expertise, a lot less of, you know, 200 people sitting in, in, in a room caring about this if it wasn't for Kibi and Ibrahim and team pumping money, funds and commitment into programs like this. I just think that as an industry, we need to yeah, um, do it for ourselves. As practitioners, we need to do it for ourselves. And over the next five to 10 years, if we're focusing on wheels turning, which we haven't been with the IPTNs, we've been focused on programs and business plans. And I think officials are more worried about getting their funding secured by getting the report in than the actual number of tires turning. And if we just focus on tires turning, wheels turning, partnerships and moving the informal sector towards formality, while in my view, the state moves towards more informality, um, I think we, we may be set up to have a different form of a solution than what we uh, um, look from across the seas. But, um, but, but, but introducing accessibility, Jared, I think is such an important um, paradigm shift, which we, we need to undertake as a, as a country. Thank you, Justin. Lots of wisdom there. Um, Bob Stanway. Um, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me? Um, great. Um, just to say hi to a lot of my friends and colleagues all over the place, all over the world. Um, just some personal thoughts. Uh, if we stand back from what we've been talking about today, and I'd like to come back to what uh, Jared was talking about, but if we just stand back and we're focused on improving public transport and we look at the budget that is provided for every year and the, and the poor quality of service and the problems that we have, my own view is that we're focusing too much on bus rapid transit, that we really should be focusing on fixing the rail system. We should be fixing the bus contracts, you know, if, if, if you just look at the costs and, and everything else involved, um, we, we, we tend to be um, splitting the atom on all issues around bus and bus rapid transit. So I think it's very important also that we focus on getting the existing systems uh, running properly. We've now got significant investments in a number of cities I think it's very important that we that we focus on getting those up and running. I think a number of participants have said that. Um, I'd also like to to say that I think that although, although the, especially from the funding finance point of view, perhaps from Treasury and National DOT, the, you know the implementation of of BLT has been disappointing. There are a number of dimensions which have been extremely positive in my view. Um, there's been a huge improvement in levels of service and levels of satisfaction of users who used to use um, worse types or modes of transport. There's been a significant in Joburg in, in sort of uh, linking of the transport network with the spatial development framework. There's been changes to the land use planning regime to, to incentivize higher developments. There've been uh, great improvements in terms of localized urban development, uh, non-motorized transport around the stations. But one of the very interesting ones, and it was picked up earlier in terms of climate change and electric taxis and all that sort of thing. But I mean, we're in the middle of a climate crisis and the work that was done, particularly by ID, ITDP uh, and, and, and Walter and Chris, showed that um, the, the savings by moving to more efficient engines on the buses was the biggest climate change intervention in the history of Johannesburg. Now, that whole thing was taken through to a point where very clever guys, good to consulting, got the project registered and everything and so forth. Nothing further has taken place in that regard, you know, that it, it, each of these systems, although they're imperfect, can make a huge impact in terms of um, carbon reduction in carbon emissions. You know, we it seems to me that we, we're not looking at some of the positive benefits of what we 
have already achieved over the years. Um, but just in terms of how to, how to take it further, I, I, I'm really worried that we, we have a, a very strong body of, of thinkers and intellectuals and planners, transport planners and so on and so forth, and engineers. But we seem to lack the ability, particularly in the authorities, to operationalize these BRTs properly. You know, it, it, it really seems like we've got a huge lack. I don't know whether it's a lack of training, lack of education or what it is, but um, lack of opportunities. But in these operational, in these authorities, there's a lack of operational expertise, a lack of scheduling, a lack of enforcement, a lack of marketing, a lack of contract management. And, and among the authorities, even, even the regulatory side is, has failed us completely. Finally, if, if, we, if we go back to Jared's presentation, you know, in terms of the, the restructuring of networks, I'm sure Walter will, will tell you that in, in early 2006, 2008, Johannesburg went through a restructuring of the network in terms of the transport plan. Not anything as, as clever and inspiring as what Jared has done, but really to, to integrate the existing metro bus network, the existing bus contracts, existing minibus taxi services, and so on and so forth, so on and so forth. It hasn't been implemented. Now that is a failure of government. Nobody else is to blame, government. The regulatory authority has failed completely. The province will not implement the, um, the new designs for the bus, well, not the new designs, but the approved transport plan says that you know buses should go here, there, et cetera, et cetera. They simply will not implement that. And I can almost guarantee you that happens in the nine provinces around South Africa. So the, the, there are some huge institutional impediments to implementing restructured networks. You know, that is one of the biggest ones that I can see because being in the trenches in Joburg, there was no way on earth that one could implement the transport plan. It, you know, the BRT was hard enough, you know, trying to engage with the operators, but you have these other operators who are spending far more money um, and they're not actually, they, they simply do not obey the law. The politicians have got other agendas. And so, you know, we can talk till the cars come home, but until we fix that type of thing, we cannot implement more efficient networks in the South African context. Anyhow, I think uh, we, we, we should focus on, 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 on trying to fix what we've got, not introducing too many new things in the, in the near future. Thanks, Jess. Thank you so much, Bob, for that concerning view. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Uh, implementation is really a, a big problem. Um, I'm excited that uh, we've got all these people involved in this panel and uh, also excited that Ibrahim said we're going to have some more sessions to, to discuss this and to hopefully come out with, with beautiful plans to implement. I see I've got uh, Matisse and Mathieson to uh, hands up. We've seen you, your video was on, so if you can just unmute, we should be able, able to hear you. Bottom left, unmute. Got that. There we go. Got that. Okay, good. Um, I'm actually not RM Matheson, I'm Ron, Ronald Matheson Hayden. I uh, don't know how that got wrong, but uh, Ron Hayden, a number of my friends and enemies will recognize me from, from Cape Town's um, uh, My City uh network working with lloyd wright and um a number of the faces and voices you've heard uh, today from 2007 through to 2016 when i retired um the one thing that uh, the one attribute of um the brt system that we tried to get right and i think in cape town uh, we more or less did was the attribute of universal accessibility which uh, you know we achieved whether it was a high floor bus or a low floor bus, and unfortunately, at the time we were implementing the high floor seemed to be the cheaper and more robust way to go, but of course that limits flexibility if you want to go beyond the last high floor platform station, um, and the low floor bus allows you to do that at different times of the day with a larger bus if your road width and geometry can can handle it, and that. Uh, 
uh, really brought joy to me because I, I had um, a friend who broke her neck diving into shallow water in Nahoon Beach in East London when she was 16, Kathy Jago, a number of people might know her. She got involved with uh, designing facilities on university campuses for um, people with all kinds of ability and disability. And um, uh, we developed a system together with what we called feeders, which went into the narrower streets and not on dedicated routes, uh, which enabled people in touch with the route uh, who lived within, um, uh, you know, a, a wheelchair or a, a hobbled walk or a crutch-assisted uh, crutch walk of our system uh, to, to go places they were never able to go um, unassisted before. And uh, those who know the, um, the, the My City system in Cape Town will realize that we did plan that grid-like network, like network because our rail system, which was the backbone then before it got burnt, um, uh, was a radial system emanating from the Cape Town CBD, which really only is of interest to about 15% of the people who engage in a, um, a morning peak period trip and an afternoon peak period trip. The rest have uh, origin destinations remote from that. And that grid does work uh, brilliantly well. Unfortunately, we're now sitting in a system with a system that has many bus taxis, taxis doing the work that the rail system used to do, and the buses are still not, and the minibus taxis and the buses, uh, uh, my, uh, the Golden Arrow buses are not universally accessible. So um, are we looking internationally and in South Africa still that provides a public transport system that has dignity, delight, and universal accessibility? I think you know, we need to know that before we start um, designing infrastructure and uh, preparing specifications for new vehicles. Um, uh, I'd love some answers from the panel. I've been retired for five years, although uh, today has been a wonderful session, um, uh, which has teased the mind and reignited some passion. Thank you so much, everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for that comments. Very important. Then have the fun, some of the panelists who want to respond on this. Uh, Harry, just it's Ibrahim. If I could just take a quick uh, step, I'd like to thank Jared. I think uh, Walter actually reminded me, and I started looking at the blog. And I actually, uh, if something triggers me, I think like like Ron uh, and hi Ron, long, long time. Uh, I, I just enjoyed the name of the blog, Human Transit, because we we were kind of looking for something, you know, to refresh our stale rhetoric. Because every South Africans are very good at world class rhetoric, right? but it gets stale if the action's not there. So I found just, just the name, human transit, because obviously public transport and people friendly, and you know, we, we've kind of stalified all of those <laughs> by not actually doing justice to them. So I think maybe human transit, if I can copy Jared's term, and obviously the, uh, and I think Jared, you've also kind of reinvigorated the word access because it was also getting a bit stale in South Africa because People would use it, but everything is about, as Justin said, the kind of uh, pragmatic supply side and, and uh, you know, it's, it's a step beyond. So I'd, I'd, I'd like, I'd like uh, at the end for you to come back and just, just say, because you do seem to have a sense of our cities, but often the politicians also with the stale, well, not just politicians, even the media, with, with the kind of stale rhetoric. So it's apartheid spatial planning, you know, even 30 years almost 30 years after the first elections. Uh, and in a sense, you know, uh, from the 80s or 90s, you know, w w new urban planning and, you know, mixed income, medium density, that kind of stuff. Uh, but I don't think when people say go beyond apartheid spatial planning, they're thinking or that kind of new urban planning. So I'd, I'd like you to kind of bring all that together with just a couple more nuggets that, I, that we can use to kind of re-energize ourselves in terms of just the, just the, just the, the, the kind of refreshing the thinking. Because I think that's what happens when you get stuck in a rut for 10, 15 years, getting, you know, you're falling behind the rest of the world a bit uh, and not achieving your potential. So I'd like to appreciate that. Thank you. Um, I, let me say a couple of things in response to that, if I could. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, one of the things that sort of motivates my career is that I was tired of hearing 
life and death issues being described in entirely technical ways in technical manuals in a way that concealed that they are in fact life and death issues. Um, you know, access to opportunity is absolutely fundamental to our success as human beings. And rather than sort of concealing that in technical conversations about uh, how we do contracting and how we organize, um, how we build organizations and how we predicted um, ridership and behavior and all those things, um, all those ref refer to useful kinds of expertise but when we talk about them, we are not connecting with people about what matters in their lives. So this connects back to an interesting point that was made earlier about implementation that we have been, that in your country, you've had the experience of doing some plans, but them never being implemented or not implemented well. And my experience has been that the planning process has to begin by thinking about the challenge of implementation and by thinking about how to make it politically unacceptable to not do this. And that requires a particular kind of story that is not a story about, that uses words like efficiency or, um, or gross cost contracting or um, projection. It uses words like freedom and opportunity um, and also then all of the things that are connected to that in terms of emissions in terms of full employment, all those other kinds of goals for a healthier society. Um, so, so yeah, that's that's really the core of it. And what, what we try to do is be the people who can talk that way, but who can also <clears throat> connect that to all of the technical work that has to be done. But the key is to make it not acceptable to just do nothing. Thank you, Jared. Abraham, if I may just step in here, and I've harped on about the, the climate action agenda, but in my view, just to do nothing in transport and to remain with the status quo is not dealing with a major component of climate change. And even if the politicians need a vehicle to go along to get us out of this um, lethargy in terms of doing something better for top public transport, You've almost got the feeling in South Africa that the politicians have said, we leave it to the taxi industry. And, you know, I can hear that argument because the taxi industry are opportunistic and they, they tend to be able to get on with the business. But I go back to my point. They, in their manner of doing the business, are not tackling the climate change issue, um, the safety issue, um, and all the other issues around the problems associated with the deregulated industry. So... A vehicle for me is climate change. I mean, it's happening all over the world and transport is a huge part of the climate change agenda in every country. Up to 30% of carbon emissions are from transport in many, many countries. And um, things like producing sasol from coal and all that sort of stuff is gonna go, and diesels are gonna go. So I keep harping back to an initiative. So electric vehicles and climate change to me are some kind of a platform to get the politicians on board that's all I'll finish on. Thank you, Rob. Anybody else who want to say a few words in closing? And then I would like to uh, give Ibrahim opportunity to, for his last words and to close the session for us as host. Seems to me everybody is comfortable. Ibram, you would like to say a few closing words and to close the session for us? Uh, thank you, uh, Harry. Uh, basically, I'd like to thank all, all the speakers. Uh, they've all volunteered their time from their busy schedules. Uh, we really set it up today as a kind of sampling of the big big issues and, and looking for kind of ways to reinvigorate the, uh, the kind of grappling with, with the challenges. I, I think we've moderately achieved it because I, I, I feel I've had enough food for thought to uh, have a few uh, innovative dreams tonight or, or maybe when I get up in the morning at sunrise. Uh, 
connect some dots. Uh, I, I think each one of the, the speakers has brought a kind of refreshing element to, uh, to where we are. The, the main takeaways are we have to strike that fine line between uh, uh, formalizing versus uh, uh, ending up with uh, unimplementable grand schemes. Uh, we need to improve uh, the human aspects of 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 uh, of the services. Uh, we probably need to start setting the agenda with regard to climate change, uh, but using that as a catalyst to get public transport, uh, you, you know, quite concretely uh, positioned to. Uh, to kind of lift itself up by, by its bootstraps almost. And I think on the planning side, I think, I think uh, what Jared's done is uh, provoked uh, quite a refreshing way of, uh, of looking at, uh, I, I think the key, some of the key kind of lines that I will sit and think about for the next few days, uh, especially the point about uh, high, high ridership is diverse ridership. Uh, you know, design design your system for many purposes, uh, and often we, us, the media, the planners, and the politicians all just end up thinking of the peak period, uh, kind of work trip, maybe maybe school trip if it's motorized, uh, and then and then secondly, try you know, there there is that that space between uh, the real mass transit modes and. Uh, and the re and and the kind of extended paratransit modes, and the anchor there is we we do have some of these historic uh, uh, kind of semi longer distance commuter bus subsidized services which are called the provincial contracts. We do have some of these city bus services, old municipal bus routes, uh, especially in Johannesburg, uh, Itikwini, which is Durban, and uh, city of Schwane, uh, Pretoria, and possibly a lot of the Gab stuff. Uh, in in Cape Town serves as a kind of legacy municipal type service, uh, and already with those four cities, you've got quite a large pot of existing flows there from the public transport network grant, say for the IPTN phases, and it, it has kind of uh, moved beyond say heavy infrastructure for the last five years, but still we stuck because I, I think there's a lot of uh, Negotiation and operational and management skills that have been lost. Uh, so we so we're moving slower than we were during the 2008 to 2012 phase. Uh, but I think just those four cities with the current flows that they have, and even ignoring the rail, the rail money, which is also most of it goes to those cities. Uh, there's a substantial amount of let's call it network redesign. I think along the lines of what Jared and Rob Rob have been talking about, uh, that could start to fill in that that kind of full picture, you know, the genuine mass transit. So where you've got strong corridors and, and strong flows, and I think a lot of our challenge there is uh, because uh, a lot of the initial BRT Phase One routes had to be fast tracked for the World Cup, and they were done in two years, and then the momentum was lost after that. They never really fleshed out. To be a proper phase one, you know, two corridors intersecting, getting high frequency on, 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 on a wider, wider network coverage, similar to the principles I'm seeing where, uh, you know, you take uh, conventional bus routes and, 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 and make, make them cover a lot of ground, but at, at much higher frequency. Uh, so then you can even forget about timetables and stuff. So, so I think there is a lot of scope. So I think, um, I'm I'm open to suggestions on on how we take this forward uh, from uh, cities, from professionals, from uh, uh, from anyone who's interested in this topic. Uh, and I think that's why it's preferable to have it as, as a transport forum uh, topic. Uh, so uh, I think we've we've sparked a lot. Uh, now the thing is to let it percolate and and uh, take some direction. I, I don't know if anyone has any ideas on the way forward, but we or we let it percolate for a while and and communicate online. So I think Harry can circulate my Gmail address, and anyone can bounce off any weird and wonderful blue sky ideas. 
but I think I think we've we've got enough food for thought uh, to to now sit and kind of get a get a good strategic handle on on the next steps. Uh, I think maybe we're even falling behind uh, Kigali, you know, from from way the way Chris Chris has put it. Uh, so I think with that, I'd like to just go around again. If anybody has any closing thoughts on on the way forward, uh, but I'd like to from my side end by saying I'm very appreciative, especially to Walter who suggested this. I, I was feeling quite bad in Ju July when I, I told him, you know what, uh, we, we don't really want to waste your time and stuff. Uh, but he kind of said, you know, he, he felt that we, we needed to kind of make an effort to pull together the people interested in this uh, topic who've been around a while and put some minds together and, and get a conversation going again. And I think, I think we've achieved that. Thank you very much, Walter. I think Harry, you can uh, go around if anyone has any ideas and then we can, you can close it. Thank you. Thank you, Ibrahim. Uh, yes, from my side as well, thank you very much for being our host today and the brainchild and putting together this panel for us. Um, definitely it will be unacceptable should we not have follow up sessions on this. And thank you, Jared, for that one. Um, and uh, we're in the process now planning for next year for the transport forum. And I will definitely engage you with Ibrahim so that I uh, kindly include you in the planning that we can uh, formalize it and, and communicate to all everybody to, to see what we're going to do. But okay, maybe I see Rob, uh, you unmuted. Do you want to say a few closing statements? No, just thank you. I, maybe, I, maybe I put my hand up accidentally, but uh, I also learned a lot from the other speakers and it was nice to engage and to get the uh, other perspectives. And I think as Ibrahim says, let it percolate, food for thought and, 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 and continue the, 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 uh, the momentum that's starting. Thank you, Rob, much appreciate it. Anybody else want to say a few words in closing? Uh, Harry, Harry, thank you very much. It's Eric here. Thanks, Eric. Yeah, thank you very much. And thank you to all the speakers. You've put a bright team together. Uh, yeah, we learned a lot the whole day. But I hope that uh, more than anyone else, the BOC operators and the cities, I hope they've learned a lot. And from this session, they'll go and uh, implement and improve. But uh, thank you very much. It was a well-deserved day. Thank you. Thank you, Eric, for the kind words. Really appreciate it. Great, everybody. Thank you very much. Again, thank you to our international presenters uh, for joining us at awkward times and so on. We really appreciate your effort in preparing uh, and, and your support. So we really appreciate that. And we're looking thank, forward to Thank you, Harry. Thank you very much, guys. Take care. I'm going to end the session now. Thank you very much.